Oopsie doopsie, pretend now. Okay, um, Chris, I'm going to rely on you. You can you can uh, see this? Yep, I can see that. And I'm going to monitor the chat in case anyone pipes in here. OK, awesome. So what we'll do, guys, is um, this presentation has two parts to it. The first part is more focused on high-level strategy, how you get going, and actually thinking about your prospecting. More thinking about your customer, thinking about the market as it stands today. We're going to go over an agenda. And then we have actually really lucky to have Chris here because we're going to get a technical dive, deep dive into actionable techniques that you can actually use to begin prospecting. So I know the, the title on, on um, Ryerson Startup School is a little bit different from this, but I like to, and Chris and I like to call this, this presentation the human side of prospecting because ultimately that's what sales is. It's just being a human being. A little bit about me, guys, I, I uh, will quickly pull this in. I'm, I have over 10 years in sales, both in executive leadership management and also as an individual contributor. Currently, I'm um, running my own startup as a partner of the chief revenue officer. We're a mobile application for scavenger hunts called Goose Chase with over $2 million in, in revenue. I'm responsible for uh, customer success, marketing, sales, and everything that falls in between those, those groups like operations. Uh, I play for the Canadian Beach soccer team. I've um, run an Ironman and, and I'm a competitive long distance endurance athlete. I also consider myself quite emotional and, um, of course, a future Maple Leafs Stanley Cup parade participant. Chris, if you want to give a, a quick intro of yourself. Definitely. Thanks, Al. And Cleo, yes, I was here two years ago, but I took last year off. I was uh, traveling with my brother, so I chose travel with my brother over the startup school. So apologies, everybody, but I'm here this year. I'm super excited. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, this is me on the right here uh, in a tube in my condo pool. Uh, I've been in sales for about eight years. I've been both an individual contributor, carrying a bag. Uh, I've just recently moved into a management position. I'm loving it. So right now I work at a company called leveljump.io. For anyone who is a Ryerson student, you're probably familiar with the digital media zone. So we were incubated there for a couple years. Uh, we recently moved out. Um, I'm a director of sales there. We're a sales training and sales enablement platform. I can actually tell you a little bit about that later in the presentation. Um, before that, I was at a company called Salesforce. If you're not familiar with Salesforce, Course, this is a customer relationship management tool. Uh, I was working mostly with uh, startups. Um, I've also been a startup founder myself. So uh, I ran a company called Avuvo. We were a 3D printing marketplace. Um, that was also incubated at the digital media zone. So for all you aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, if you're looking for somewhere to house and grow and develop your business, look towards the digital media zone because it is an incredible experience. Um, Al, if you hit the arrow key a little bit more, um, there's a couple more points. Um, we also won the 25K Slate business plan competition. I think that's still around. So you know, if you guys have business plans or lean model canvases drafted up, um, submit them to the Slate business plan competition because um, super impactful experience for me. Um, a little bit about me uh, personally, uh, I've never run an Ironman. I'm not on the Canada Beach soccer team, but I do play the guitar. So that is uh, my fun little fact here. Um, Al, that's it for me. I'll kick it back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so fun, fun story about Chris and I and how we kind of have a relationship. Chris and I went to university together. After university, Chris and I both worked at Canon together selling photocopiers. Then we both worked at Salesforce together. Then we both worked at a startup called Flashstock together where we went through an acquisition. And then we actually moved to work for another startup, um, both in tandem. So we've been working together and been friends for a, a really long time. And uh, we're such good friends that I've trusted Chris to, to try to teach me guitar. It's not going that great for me personally. Not that he's a bad teacher, because he's quite good. I'm just not, um, not musical, which is why you didn't see that on my slide. Well, it's just, it's hard with quarantine to do those, those lessons, so. Fair. So I, um, I want to pause and I want to revisit, as you guys look at Chris in his hotel condo on the right-hand side there, a little floaty bear, um, I want to revisit that story that I told you guys at the beginning of the, uh, of the presentation in discussion about your Google search on how to get to work early. Of all of the options that you might see on getting to work early, you might see things like go to bed early. You might see um, wake up earlier. You might see change your nutrition. You might see get a bike. You might see get a motorbike. One of the options you might see is get a car. And 
That option, for the sake of this story, let's just say, is one that interests you. So I want you guys to imagine now that it's in your mind that you are thinking of purchasing a car. I want you to think about the different ways that you might go about moving through that process. For most people in today's society, it's not that much different. So you typically start Googling car manufacturers. You start looking at feature sets that you like, whether that's online, talking to your parents, talking to your friends. Maybe you start to think about what cars your friends have or what cars your parents have, what cars are from your childhood, and begin to imagine yourself um, driving that car. And so you start to look up dealerships. You might go on Auto Trader. You might go to specific websites of cars. You might start Googling car images. You might start reading um, black book reviews. But overall, you're going to be able to come to some sort of narrowed down solution of what two or three brand manufacturers and possibly car makes that you really like that you'd like to purchase. You might have somebody that helps you with that, but ultimately you're going to come to that decision. After that, most people are going to contact the dealership. They're going to go for a meeting, but that meeting is typically going to be structured around one thing. And if, if this was an interactive presentation, I'd ask everybody what that was. Everybody's thinking it, it's a test drive. So at this point, you're going for a test drive of that car. You're probably asking some pretty pointed questions. The dealership is presenting you with a price offer, which chances are you probably already know the amount the car costs. And you probably have a good understanding of what the cheapest options on the market are based on your research. And you have an idea of what the most expensive options are, whether that's loaded with features, whether it's a used car, whether it's a new car, you kind of have all of that information at your fingertips. So you leave with the price and you might go back to visit the dealership one more time to negotiate and ultimately sign the paperwork and then pay for the car. So why do I tell you all about that story? And let me get through here. Um, I, I, well, why I tell you all about that story is because I want to talk to you today about today's customer, the customer journey, knowing your customer, and then diving more into practical techniques and technology to consider more with, with Chris. Chris, if you want to quickly go over your agenda as well. You're still on mute, Chris. Thanks, buddy. I was muted there. <clears throat> so for, uh, for today, I'm going to be talking about more practical use cases. So I find that uh, Alishan is excellent at, at the theory of sales, and I like to spend my time um, sharing practical examples. So um, you know, there, there's entire university curriculums dedicated to how to sell better. And because I only have three hours here, uh, what I'm going to focus on is just giving you um, a couple tips on how to book meetings with people who you don't know or who don't, who don't know your potential company. And then two tips for having better conversations when you book those meetings. Um, we, at my company, we use a software that records every sales conversation we have. So I'm going to actually show you some live examples of what um, customers are saying to me on the phone when I use these tips I'm going to be showing to you. Uh, and then we're going to finish it off with a, a couple of, of takeaways and, and ways that you can go about self-educating yourself on sales and implementing some of these techniques into your own startups as you grow. Yeah. Thanks, Russ. As a way to try to, you know, try to inject a little bit of interaction and engagement into this presentation, um, for my part of the presentation, if you guys have questions, please type them into the chat. Chris will uh, kind of pause the presentation and moderate those questions um, so that we can kind of answer them as they're contextually relevant. And then same thing, when we flip over, I'll be moderating the chat and I'll uh, pause Chris's talk tracks. We'll give each other opportunities to be able to jump in and see if there are any questions so that we can make sure that we're focusing on uh, the question as it's relevant to what we're talking about. So um, you remember the car story. We've purchased our beautiful new car. And what was the point of me telling you all of that? And the reason that I tell you all that is because of this simple reason in that today, and this, this study is actually from 2013, so the updated version actually shows an even higher percentage. But today, customers are actually 60 to 70% through a sales process before they ever engage a salesperson. Um, that is a pretty powerful number, especially because most people, most people predict that that's actually closer to 75 to 80% now. And if we talk about that in a different way, what, what we're saying essentially is that People already know what they want to buy before they ever talk to anybody about actually buying it. They have all of the education available to them. They have all of the resources available to them to be able to move through that before ever coming to a salesperson 
with a decision or with a conversation or questions that they have. So if we think about the different ways that people have the ability to gain information, you know, most people just think it's Google or talking to friends, but there's a plethora of ways that people gather information quickly through Twitter, through programs like, like Mention. Facebook is actually still a really good source of in information. Instagram informs us about social trends and norms. And then of course, LinkedIn is a more professional way to actually recruit information on not only business-based products, but also consumer-oriented products as well. So today's customer is more educated than ever before, has so many resources available as we can see, and already has formed opinions and a point of view before ever coming to speak to a salesperson. So this is the slide, right? If that's the case, then, you know, let's just panic, wipe our hands, throw our brain <laughs> up there, and, uh, and see what happens. But I don't think it's time to panic yet. There's still hope. So what I want to talk about is the buyer journey. And a buyer journey is essentially something that every single one of us goes through every single time we buy anything, any single time we decide to make a purchase, whether it's a product or a service. Now, a buyer journey can be simple, three stages, awareness, consideration, decision. And a good example of that would be, you know, think of yourself um, having a sore throat or a fever. You're like, oh my God, I'm achy all over. What's wrong with me? You're like, oh, maybe I have strep throat. Okay, well, what are my options for relieving or curing my symptoms? Well, I can see the primary care physician, I can go to the ER room, or I can even go to perhaps over-the-counter medicine. Well, the ER costs a lot and I have insurance, my health is important, so off I go. They can be a little bit more complex, where we're looking at more of this through a tech journey, where somebody is attracting you, possibly through, let's just say, an Instagram ad, uh, blogs, website, content, press releases, videos, social media, some more classic forms of advertisement, converting you through online signups or landing pages or call to action like, hey, come to our website, enter this coupon code, get 50% off. After that, they're moving you through to the close stage, which is more like closing the deal, getting you to purchase more, and then ultimately delight, which is focused on retention, premium content associated with what are your interests in that process and then moving you through. Now for me, these last two buyer journeys are a little bit too rudimentary. I don't think they capture the complexity and all of the mini steps that many of us as individuals go through when we consider a buyer journey. So this is what I feel is more representative of what everybody goes through today. So first in pre-awareness, we need to be aware that there's a problem. So for startups and thinking about your customers, you need to make them aware that they have a problem because let's face it, a lot of the businesses that we run and that we start as entrepreneurs is businesses that are new to the marketplace addressing a problem that people haven't previously thought of as a problem in that way. They're used to doing things in a certain way. Um, you know, if we go back to the car example, before the invention of the car, if people are using um, horses, just as an example, or even bicycles. They have no understanding that they have a problem that they can't get somewhere faster. So we, as a, as a company, need to make them aware that the problem exists in detail and show them why it's actually a problem. Once we do that, we can kind of get to that place of awareness. So now they know that there's a problem and they consider it big enough to want to solve it. Now we can start the solution around it. Okay, I know I need to get somewhere faster. Motorbikes don't exist yet. So am I going to be looking at a car? Obviously that is a bad joke, especially to the silence of this presentation, but it still gets the point across. Once people are aware that they uh, there are solutions to solve the problem that they now know exists, they can start to go out and look for more information. How does this work? How will it help me? What's my unique process in actually gaining this information to make sure that I want to move forward in considering this as something that will actually solve that problem or consider it as something that is an investment that I want to make? So now I'm at the emotional stage. I want to look at case studies, testimonials, client stories. I want to talk to my friends, my family. I really want to get a feeling for 
Is this something that I'm going to connect with? After that, I can start to move through to my justification stage, which is price comparison, charts, features, um, really that logical, does this make sense? Does this emotional decision make sense against all of the different logical triggers that I typically use to determine whether or not a purchase makes sense? Finally, it's the purchase, just the facts. Shipping, tax, return policies, guarantees, give me comfort that I'm working with a good vendor that understands that if something goes wrong, I'll have the ability to come back to them and they'll rectify it. After the purchase is done, we go into a post-purchase phase. Post-purchase is all about reworking your customer through that buyer journey. Now, depending on the type of company you are and the number of products you have or um, the different markets you serve, your customers may go through all of these stages or they may go through a few of these stages. But ultimately, every single buying journey goes through a buying cycle. And generally, no matter how quick the buying cycle or how quick the stage is, this occurs in every purchase. Uh, I want to pause there quick and see if there's any uh, comments or questions, Chris. And Chris, you might be muted. Yeah, no, I'm not seeing any relevant questions. It's mostly okay. just where's the slide deck and stuff. Okay, cool. Cool. So, um, thanks for that. So, I, I just want to highlight this example in a more simple way because I think you know abstract and theory can be a little bit challenging to grasp when it's a first time con uh, concept. And I want you guys to think of another story. Um, Chris has probably heard me tell this a million times, and it's just really relevant. So, let's just say you guys are walking past your favorite store in the mall, and I want everybody to kind of visualize walking past their favorite store. The mall's teeming, it's busy. Um, you can be close to people, another bad joke, sorry. Uh, and you walk into your favorite store, you see a jacket on the rack that you like, it catches you as you're walking by, you pick it up, you walk to the cash register, and you purchase that jacket. Now, in that case, you've gone through all these stages of the buying cycle, extremely quickly right you realize that hey i don't i didn't know that i needed a black jacket oh there's a black jacket that could probably possibly solve this this clearly works like any other black jacket i'm emotionally attached because i think this is beautiful the logic stage is really interesting in a purchase like this because it's actually happening between you picking up the jacket and moving to the cash register you're justifying your purchase to yourself in that i love the buttons on this i don't have a jacket like this um, you know, am I really ever going to see something like this again? So I better not take a look or be, take a chance. I'm just going to go buy it. Whatever those processes are that you go through in your own mind to justify purchasing it. And then the purchase, well, you're already familiar with this vendor. They're your favorite store. You know, they have a great return policy, a solid guarantee and workmanship on their product, on their product. So you're fine with the facts and post-purchase, you made the right decision because you're the, you're going to be wearing it, you know, there might be a coupon code or a scratch and save at the counter that you're used to getting from this vendor, whatever that is. That's just a short example of even a purchase as quick and as painless and as simple as that, you always go through the buying stages, um, the buying cycle seven stages. Hey Al, before we jump off, we got a question about the consideration stage. <laughs> sure. So, yeah, what if you're a new company and you have no testimonials or no case studies just yet? You know, how do they how do they create that emotional connection with the buyer in the consideration stage without any real assets? Yeah, good question. So, um, this can happen in a couple of different ways, right? You can always use customer references at this stage of the at this stage of the game. Essentially, people want to know that other people have invested in the same way. Now, if you're a brand new company and you don't have any customers, chances are you're giving your product away for free. And the emotional stage consideration is that somebody's willing to commit with you. They might have a personal relationship with you. They might have a, a belief in your company. So it's a very solid question and it definitely depends on the stage of the company, but there always is an opportunity to create that emotional, um, an emotional purchase. Did you want to add anything to that, Chris? Uh, nope, I thought that was a good answer. But as you're typing or as you're responding, there is another uh, question here. Uh, oh, there's actually a couple now. So, uh, would you structure a sales presentation in this fashion? Um, I think maybe uh, yes. Yeah, we can table that for uh, just a, a moment because that kind of comes towards later. Um, but I'll to the second part of Yasin's question is: What part of this process should be filled by marketing versus sales? Ah, good question. So 
I'm not sure if my if the presentation really covers that, but I think you know to answer that question, I don't think that today, based on the way that we see the buying cycle happening, that we should be thinking about things as sales and marketing and support, and we should really consider using more um, holistic terminology. And the word that I choose, and the reason that I'm the chief revenue officer and responsible for all those things, is because they're very blurred in terms of the lines that each division accompanies. For example, if we think about marketing, people traditionally think about marketing at the beginning stages. Advertisements for uh, early stage buyers where you're just getting somebody familiar or allowing them to see that you exist as a problem. However, if we go a little bit further, once you're in the emotional stage and somebody's asking a sales, a sales representative, hey, do you guys have any testimonials or client studies or um, blog articles? Oftentimes, that material is actually created by marketing. So you can start to see that it's not really thinking about this in terms of sales and marketing, but thinking about it in terms of the entire customer journey and how every member of your team is an important aspect of all of that. In the pre-awareness stage, somebody might have a question that can't be answered by an advertisement. So they might reach out to your company and ask, hey, you know, just had this quick inquiry, what do you think? Now, they might not absolutely be ready to get into that interest and education stage, but that answer needs to come from a salesperson. In terms of support, you know, you're consistently weaved through this process when you're custom when you already have customers that have made a first time purchase. So it's a it's an interesting question. Um, I believe you said yes, seen, but uh, I think the answer is not as straightforward as this should be sales, this should be marketing. I think we should be really looking at business and um, really the funnel as a revenue funnel, not a sales and marketing funnel. So hopefully that answered your question. Yep, she says makes a lot of sense and thanks, but we got a couple more here about the buying cycle. Okay. So Wilson's asking, would some items under the post-purchase stage also consist of repurchasing, reorder, and customer loyalty or retention? Yeah, so re repurchase, customer loyalty, retention, sorry guys. Need to decline that. Um, oh, lost you. Sorry about that. Okay. Não ia chegar nada. Eu não tenho. Então, vai para o There we go. Okay. Do you mind just asking that question one more time for me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, where is it? Okay, so would some items under the post-purchase stage also consist of repurchasing, reorder, and customer loyalty or retention? Yes, absolutely. So customer loyalty and retention is definitely under post-purchase. Repurchase, reorder, I would actually say that those go back into the buying cycle and you're moving people through. So if somebody's considering repurchasing or reordering, it's likely that they have identified that the first purchase didn't solve the problem for them. So they're interested in continuing to purchase more to solve something else that they're looking to do. So, so it depends on whether or not you're a commodity or a SaaS or you have multiple multiple products, but in terms of where they land in the buying cycle. But I would say that customer loyalty, delight and surprise, definitely in post-purchase because that's reassurance. But I would say that post-purchase is should actually be extended depending on who you are as a business to include repurchase under awareness or possibly interest education. And then you can kind of see that, um, that little arrow moving forward. Cool. Excellent answer. Wilson says, thanks for your insights. Uh, so there's another couple of questions here, Al. Uh, Jason Palmer says, you know, he's at a prospect, tell him what you have is great. I understand it, but we're so big that no matter what we do, we'll be successful. Where does that exchange fit into the buying cycle here? Well, you know, I would I would love to take it up if this was that's a really good question because it's a great question to to start a debate. A company that's saying or a prospect that's saying no matter what we do, we'll succeed, really they're just being polite and brushing you off. And I don't mean to be blunt, but ultimately you have not done a good job of showing the person that that pain that you solve is a big enough problem for them to consider evaluating your solution. And that's really important. They don't see that as a game changer or they don't see it as a priority to continue down the path working with you and they're being polite 
in, in brushing you off. That's a, that's a vague objection intentionally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that yeah. probably comes down to um, the ability to uncover that pain in that first meeting. So Jason, hopefully that helps. Yep. He says, thanks. Uh, last question here for you, Al. So, um, how can you determine, and this is from Ashley, how can you determine where the breakdown is in this buying cycle with potential clients? So let's say you've got clients who are coming to your website, but maybe they're not converting on your lead form or they're not converting to purchase. You know, how do we determine where customers are falling off in this buying cycle? Yeah, the, the best way to do that is, is to talk to them, right? I mean, there's no silver bullet uh, to these types of things. You have to put in the work. You know, as a company, we're constantly asking our customers, asking our, pro- our prospects to provide us feedback, to give us um, information on their experience, ways that they think that, that, that um, they would like to see things improving, because that's really the only way to understand. I mean, you can absolutely use data. For example, if you have, let's just say, five, five sales stages and you notice that at one stage, you're getting an 80% drop off in terms of your conversion from stage to stage. That will probably give you a good indication of, hey, I need to, I need to fix this. But even that high level data isn't enough of a specific metric for you to understand what to fix. So if you, for example, let's just say, notice that everybody's dropping off at that emotional stage. You know, they're not moving forward to justification, to logic. That's good. I mean, it's absolutely great that you're aware of that. But you need more. You need to understand why aren't people connecting with my product, my product or with my service emotionally enough to want to move forward. And the only way to really understand that is to ask your customers and look for specific patterns so that you can make fixes. Now, there's also the opportunity to hypothesize and, and kind of A-B test stuff. But oftentimes, those things take time. They need a, a fairly big audience. And you really have to be okay with failing multiple times, which, you know, frankly, not a lot of companies have that amount of money and that amount of time to be able to do that. So get on the phone, talk to people, ask questions, you know, and be okay having your feelings hurt, I would say. Chris, how would you uh, add on that? No, I think you nailed it. I think it, it comes down to having a volume of visitors and maybe like heat mapping what they're doing on the website. But ultimately, you'll never know until you actually speak to your buyers. So that's why I think it's so important to do those customer interviews, whether they're current customers, churned customers, or customers who didn't buy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, got- you can use, sorry, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say, we have one more question, but it sounds like you're going to add on to that. Yeah, I was just going to say, you can always use tools like SurveyMonkey or um, Google Forms to kind of collect data and aggregate it. And- and, and do some analysis on it, but there's nothing more powerful than actually talking to somebody and hearing, you know, at what points do they inflect on? What are they passionate about? What do they really like? What do they really not like? And opening yourself up to, to receiving honest feedback about where your product falls down or, or where your process falls down is the best way to learn. Um, if anybody's really interested, uh, the founders of, of Airbnb, Brian Chesky, did a, a very, very honest podcast, um, uh, Startup Growth, I believe. I think it's the first podcast with uh, Reed Richardson, the one of the investors at LinkedIn. And they talk a lot about that, um, just you know, making sure that they were in front of their customers. And that really stuck with me. And I think that's that's been a very common theme for a lot of really successful startups. Cool. Oh, we got one last question here. Um, so, yeah. Jen, the, the emotional stage is usually overlooked by financial institutions. What would your recommendation be to incorporate a more sympathetic way of reaching customers when it comes to building trust with clients? Um, do you want want to- I'm actually going to touch a little bit on that, Jen, around, around building trust with potential customers. But, Al, um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say, you know, that is a very specific, it's a niche question to, the, the, the person you're selling to, the size of the institution, and really understanding your buyer, that's super key, is what do they care about? You know, a lot of people think the emotion, like they, the best way to explain this is at the emotional stage, it's really about what the person you're selling to cares about for themselves. Oftentimes people go into, and Chris, you can definitely attest to this as well, people think about selling in terms of ROI as being emotional. ROI is very logical. You know, because if you do this, you will save this and that makes sense for you to purchase is really good on on paper. But in theory, people are 
emotional buyers. They are uh, carnal. They are um, buying not often based on that reason. They're being they're buying mostly based on the fact that it feels right. Um, the logic is just used to justify the feeling. And I bet you every single one of you guys can sit there and think of a time where, you know, poss possibly arguing with your partner or with your parents or with your siblings or with your friends. And you're just like, you know what? I know you're right, but I don't care. I'm going to dig my heels in and I'm going to just ride this argument out because I will not listen to reason. And that's not very far away from your buyer. So, it really is taking the time to understand what those people care about. You know, do they care about the, that their metrics, what they're measured on? So if that's the case, how do you speak to that? Do they care about the company's bottom line? How do you speak to that? Do they care about looking good in front of their boss? How do you speak to that? So um, taking the time to build those personas and really making sure you understand is the best way to evoke that. Cool. So. I appreciate all the questions. I'm just gonna mute everything. Now that's it for questions. We can uh, perfect. We can jump off there. Perfect. So thanks for all the questions, guys. Um, we'll keep going here. So there's a but. Fat Batman or Fat Man. He's sad. He's happy. He's emotional. Uh, yeah, the, the reason I have this slide here is because I wanted to kind of touch on that last point is that buyers are emotional. They're carnal. They buy from the id. You know, the, that is a very, um, you know, it's almost an innate sexual process. Buying, it makes us feel good. It evokes emotions in us that we actually really enjoy. So again, we go back to that panic mode. So I've, you know, built all this buyer journeys and I've kind of learned all this stuff but you're just telling me that people buy emotionally. So I guess it's time for me to start panicking again. And, uh, it's not, um, the key is to, again, going back to what we just talked about, know your customer, you must be where your customers are. And what I mean by that is you need to understand your customers better than they understand themselves and their buying habits. So we talked a little bit about that example of the car up front and that's super relevant because you can see, all of the different ways that somebody might consider getting to work on time, you know, and as a car company, if I'm where my customers are when they're first learning about solutions to problems they know they want to solve, I have a much better opportunity at actually engaging those customers and showing them that I know that I have a solution to their problem. So your job as a business, as a revenue stream focused business or revenue focused business is to educate your customers, Make them aware that you're available to solve their problems. You need to focus your messaging on them, not you. My biggest pet peeve and what, we, what you guys see all the time is customers talking about how they can help you, how they can help you, how they can help you. And all the messaging is focused on them as a business, them as a business. But what they really should be talking about is your problems, talking about it from your experience. Hey, we understand that this is the experience that you have. We're people too. That's an experience that we can empathize, uh, empathize with and understand and really focus on, on you as a messaging. To take that one step forward further, you need to be the expert. You need to research the cycle that your customers are going through. You need to understand what are the steps they're going to take in order to find you, in order to ask questions about questions about you. What platforms are they visiting? Are your customers most likely to be on LinkedIn? Are they most likely to be on Instagram? And LinkedIn's really not somewhere where they visit. Are they more likely to ask people? Are they likely to look for case studies or testimonials? You know, do they require trials? Do they need to get their hands in the product? Where will they look? We just covered that. And is it available? So is, is it available from the standpoint of, is this something that other people are doing? Or is this something that only you're able to solve? Is it simple to use? Can it be um, touched easily? All these questions that we're asking. So um, I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna move it over to Chris to go more into detail on outbound prospecting. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about where to go from here and how to leverage some of the information that I've talked about at a high level. We've also posted the slides early in the presentation. So uh, I know I moved through things fairly quickly. Like I said, it tends to be more engaging. Um, but you should be able to leverage these slides and, and we can open it up to questions at the end too. So Chris, I'm going to exit here and stop. All right. And, and I'll 
I'll go to you, and I will be in the chat to moderate. Cool. As you're going. Thank you, Al. Everybody, let me know when you can uh, see my screen here. Al, are you, do you see my screen? Uh, yes, I do. And it says an intro to outbound prospecting. It does, and I'm going to mute. Give me one second. Okay, cool. First, when you're ready for uh, for like questions and stuff, just let me know. Yeah, just let me know as I come in. Um, cool. Okay. So again, thanks so much for having me, everyone. You know, it's a huge pleasure to be a part of the startup school again this year. Um, so tonight, I'm going to be walking through a, a very brief introduction to outbound prospecting. And by outbound prospecting, I mean booking conversations or formal business meetings with people who don't know you and who do not know your company. So what Ali Sean walked you through was very much sort of an inbound model where customers are in active buying cycles and at some point they engage with your company. Now we're talking about com companies who do not know you, do not know your company and may not even know uh, the problem that your solution solves for and whether or not they have it. So. Um, I also don't know what phase any of your businesses are in. So some of you might have fully fledged launch startups and you're actively selling. Some of you are likely still in the ideation phase or exploratory market research. And maybe you're just looking to book information interviews with people. So what I'm gonna show you today is, uh, you know, regardless of whether or not you're selling, an easier way to book meetings with people who don't know you, who don't know your company, and a couple tips on how to have better conversations with those people after you've booked the meeting. So if any of you have ever tried to cold email or cold call people, try and initiate sales cycles or conversations, um, you probably know how difficult it is to get a response from someone and how frustrating it can be when all of your emails or your phone calls go unanswered. Um, the reason is because people's time is their most valuable resource and they don't give it up very easily and they don't give it up to just anyone. So there's a couple of stats I wanna show you that kind of paints the picture for this. So, you know, the average average open rate on a cold email is 15%. So this means if you sit down your computer, you've launched your company, and you send 100 cold emails to potential customers, only 15 of them are gonna be opened, and probably only one of them is going to be responded to. So we really gotta put in our work here to actually build relationships with people who don't know us and who don't know our companies. Our potential customers are getting 200 plus emails a day. You know, we can think about all the emails we get as consumers, times that by 10, and that's how many emails you get as an executive at a Fortune 500 company. So to get your email noticed and read, there's a lot of things we need to do. On top of all of this, it typically takes between eight to 12 touch points to get a response from a potential buyer. Most salespeople give up after the first touch point. So what we need to know here is that Repetition and persistence is going to be super impactful and super important in actually getting these meetings with potential customers or people we want to have information interviews with. Now that's all the kind of the bad news here, but what I'm going to share with you is a couple tips that can make this process slightly easier. And we are going to start with email tips. So email is one of my favorite channels for booking meetings with people um, because it's fast and it's simple. But what I'm going to start off with here, and this, you know, I'd love to get some interaction from the audience here. Um, what I'm showing you here is an example of a typical sales email that I get almost every single day. Now this one isn't bad, uh, it's short enough, it's in bullet points, the format is, is pretty readable and it's concise. It's very close to a good sales email, but I would love to get some feedback from the audience on why you think an email like this went unanswered in my inbox. And now if you can kind of just man the chat there, if anything comes in, you know, why would I not respond to this email? And if you got an email like this, let me respond to it. Maybe because it was all about them and not about you. Exactly. I don't know who just chimed in there because I can't see, but that's an excellent that. answer. Shelby and uh, Yasin says no identification of problem. Rock says it's not personable. Uh, Bikong says too much work that I'd have to do. Shelby says yes, that was me. So <laughs> I nailed it. <laughs> Steven says not personalized, not addressing benefits. Alexandra says selling on features, not benefits. A lot of uh, a lot of pretty sharp answers. Yeah, uh, this is not the room I was expecting. I thought this was going to be people brand new to sales. Those are okay. subject line is too long from Ashley. Yep. 
Yeah. Okay. Cool. Those are all exactly right answers. This is a this is a really smart room. So to me, this is very much a spray and pray approach. So we can see that you know it's got my full company name in there and their company name. That's pretty well a form fill. I can almost guarantee this is a mass email. You know, Shelby, I think it was you said it's not personalized. It's all about the company. So they have not mentioned my challenges once or what I might be going through as a company potentially struggling with graphic design. Had they done any research on me? they wouldn't have never even sent this email to me. I'm a director of sales. I'm not a marketer. I'm not a graphic designer. I'm obviously not the one building our marketing assets. We have a marketer on staff who does that. Um, on top of this, they included a link, you know, helpful hint, do not include links in your first email. This ended up in my spam folder and it's likely because they included uh, a link here. Um, on top of this, they just they know nothing about me. This email could have been sent to any company in the world, and as a result, um, it didn't get my attention. So, uh, incredible answers, lengthy subject line. I don't know who said that, but that's an awesome answer as well. And there's just there's nothing compelling about this for me to actually respond. So, um, I mean, it sounds like everyone knows exactly what I'm going to teach here, but uh, it's all about personalization and it's all about research. So, what makes a good sales email? Good sales emails are driven by research. So, you know, in these days where we do get 200 plus emails a day, it's the highly personalized emails that are going to get responses. Um, so if you can show that you took the time to research a prospect and their business, it shows confidence that you believe your solution is right, or you wouldn't have dedicated the time to actually do that research and reach out. And usually this is quite comforting for a prospect and it helps us really understand whether or not this is gonna be a meeting that is gonna be worth my time. So research driven, I'm gonna to touch more on this in a second. Second, is it focus on the recipient and their business? So someone mentioned this in the chat. You know, this, I think that maybe was Shelby, is that email I showed you was all about the company. They didn't mention my business once, apart from like a, a crappy form fill on the subject line. They know nothing about me, or maybe if they do, they didn't show me that they know anything about me. Um, it was a little bit lengthy too. So research shows that good sales emails that get responses are between 50 and 125 words. Now this is not, my research. This is data that comes from software vendors who create email marketing tools that measure which emails actually get response. And they have found that emails that are shorter and more concise are more likely to be responded to. Um, so the rule of thumb is you're not going to count the words or use a word counter. Um, two scrolls on a mobile device. So my advice is send a couple sample emails to yourself open them on your iPhone or Android. And if it's more than two scrolls, then you're probably having your emails a, a little bit too long. Personalized subject line. So your subject line is almost the gatekeeper to whether or not your email gets open. So highly unique emails that are so personalized that show that this email in no way could ever be a mass email are the ones that are going to get opened and the ones that are going to get your email potentially responded to. Um, lastly is give a strong call to action. So the email I showed you as a sample actually had a pretty decent call to action, but we need to make it very easy for our customers to either say yes or to no. So um, when you're booking meetings, suggest a specific day, a specific time, make it easier for the prospect to say, yes, I want to do this. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of what that looks like, but the rule of thumb is make it research driven, focus on the recipient, keep it short, make it personalized and have a strong call to action. So the first step to writing that compelling sales email is just doing the research. So you now you probably have a million and one reasons why this person should talk to you, but those are your reasons and they're not the prospects. So the first step is really writing an email that is, is well researched um, and to figure out who we should be sending our emails to, we need to understand who our ideal buyer is. So uh, if you can take a moment now to just sit back and imagine, in your mind, you know, who is the ideal customer that I want to sell to? You know, what industry are they in? How big are they? Are they growing? Are they shrinking? Did they just do layoffs? Do they host events? Do they have remote staff all over the world? What do they make? Um, think about these different things and try to understand who your ideal buyer persona is. And once you understand who your buyer persona is, try and think about in what situations they actually need your product. So for example, maybe you have like a catering startup and you specialize in high-end cuisine. Your ideal might, buyer might be Fortune 500 companies, maybe it's banks, 
uh, but banks who host a lot of events and who may need a catering company. Uh, maybe you sell software. Maybe, for example, you know you sell Google Hangouts, the tool that we're on right now. So your ideal buyers and their ideal situations might be tech companies who have offices all over the world, who have remote-based employees, who may ultimately need a sales conferencing software like the one we're on right now. So thinking about your ideal buyer and these situations where they need your product most will help you understand who you want to start reaching out to first. So a couple of ways that you can figure out who your ideal buyer is or where to go look for them is, you know, look at their company website, look at the products they offer, look at their mission, look at awards they've received, look at their executive priorities, check out LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is an awesome sort of source of data. You know, we can figure out headcounts by department. We can figure out um, what individual buyers we may want to talk to. We can look at growth rates. We can look at the job postings companies are posting, and those can really tell us a lot about the company. You may want to look at press releases. So look for quotes from executives, look at events they're hosting, look at products they're launching. So there's a ton of different ways we can do research on our buyers. And the research that we do is going to help craft the messagings that we use in our emails. So I'm going to use a live example. Uh, hey, Chris, we're back. Yeah. Um, question from Shelby. This is great for a B2B. What if we are selling to end users? Good question. So um, kind of leaning back on what, what Alishan was talking about earlier with customer interviews, I would likely try to figure out what consumer is your likely buyer. You know, think about who your low hanging fruit is. Who are the people who are going to be most likely to buy <clears throat> my, um, my software or my service or my product and then interview them and understand what traits or what characteristics my ideal buyers possess and then figure out how to find those online. So it could be that you set up trackers on Twitter or you use um, Google Alerts. So any way that you can find people online that possess those qualities. Um, most of this presentation is sort of around B2B sales, but there's a lot of tools you can use that are going to help you uncover personal characteristics that will help you identify who your ideal buyer is. Yeah, so I think, Shelby, just to add on to what Chris is saying, most companies selling to end users aren't outbound prospecting in that you're not going to the customer to engage them in a sales cycle. Really, you're working to let your customer understand that they have a problem you can solve. So we're really going back to you know knowing your buyers and being where they are from a research perspective so that you can put your content there, so that you can put your copy there, and ultimately they can make the decision to engage with you um, because you know there, there's no time to try to uh, reach out to individual end users directly usually. And another question, Chris, is um, how would you frame a request for an information interview? That's a really good question because we're talking a lot about it. So uh, how would you do that, Chris? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So framing a request for an information interview, um, usually people are more likely to respond to a request if you can tell them how they will help you. So have a very specific ask when you're reaching out to that person um, and say, hey, you know, I'm looking for some advice on XYZ. I noticed on your LinkedIn, you are a specialist in XYZ. I would love to kind of just pick your brain for about 15 minutes here and understand your perspective on you know, a product I'm working on. Uh, back at Level Jump and back when I was forming my startup, um, our ask for informational information interviews was exactly like that. It was, you know, I noticed on LinkedIn you specialize in sales training. I'm working on a solution designed for sales trainers. I would love to get your perspective on what I'm building. So tell them how they can help you and frame it as a request for help. And if you can, try and figure out how you can add value to them. You know, if you if Potentially, this is you know happy to open up my network and introduce you to anyone I know who might help you. Um, just try and show how you can help them as well. But um, the easiest way is just just ask them for help. Can I get your perspective on something I'm building? Love your feedback. Yeah, and for those of you guys who have gone through psychology 101, which I would be willing to guess that a majority of you have, um, there's a very very famous study done that 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 a lot of psychology uh, 101 classes talk about where. A, there's a long line for a photocopier and somebody walks up to the front of the line and says, hey, he says one of two things. Hey, can I cut in front of you? Or, hey, can I cut in front of you because? And what they found through the course of that study was when you add a reason for asking something, even if it's as simple as, hey, can I cut in front of you because I want to make a copy, your chances of actually succeeding go up exponentially. I can't remember the exact percent, but it's far higher than 50% closer in that 50 to 70% range. So 
To Chris's point, it's really important that when you frame an ask for an informational interview, that you give a reason, number one, why you're asking for it. Chris's example about, hey, I'm building this product and I'd love to get your feedback on it because you could add value is really great. But you also have to make sure that if you do that, you don't start selling to that person. That is sneaky and you have to make sure that you're staying in the realm of what you've asked unless they take the, the conversation in that direction. The worst thing you can do is say, hey, I'd just love to get your feedback and then be like, oh, like, you know, would you like to buy this? Uh, it, it, it'll get you some pretty uh, uh, bad, bad blood. A couple more questions here, Chris. Um, Sorry, just, I'll just touch on that one. Um, that mistake where you try to turn an information interview into a sales conversation, um, I've made that mistake many, many times. And what I found to be effective is if you can take the feedback that they gave you during that information interview, build it into your product or show that it had some influence on how you designed what you're offering, circle back to them six months later and be like, hey, you know, I took your feedback to heart, I implemented it into my product, can, uh, can we book another call to see if this is something that you may actually use or add value to you or your workflow? Awesome. Uh, you can use. So, uh, question from Mo, and I think this one's a pretty easy one for you, Chris. Does this model apply when selling to government or related entities? Um, do you want to take that one real quick? Yeah, totally. Yeah, uh, I assume it's you know it's the exact same model. Most government uh, entities have profiles on LinkedIn. Their employees are on there. They've got a ton of information and data around them. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't imagine this is very different than a traditional B2B model. You know, I have some experience selling into the government at my last startup, although it's a, a ton of corporate red tape and there's a lot more hoops you need to jump through. Um, people are motivated at, at government institutions in the same way they're motivated at uh, a private company. You know, it's really about uh, understanding the, um, the pain or the gain for that individual and then mapping your solution to how you can help them in their in their job or help the company or the, the government organization. So uh, I think the the same principles apply. Yeah, to, to just a, as an addition to that, you know, I think what Chris is talking about, what I talked about earlier, it's really easy to forget that the other end, that people on the other end of the phone are also people or on the, on, at the other end of the Zoom or on the other side of the table. And I think for sellers, it's very, or for buyers, it's very easy for, for them to forget that, that we're people as well. As salespeople, we kind of get this, strange taboo type relationship um, but we're just trying to make this human right making sure that you have something that can help somebody accomplish something they have something that can help you accomplish something so if we could take that more human approach to prospecting to selling um, we're gonna find a lot more success in finding people that are very much in the same position that we are even though you know we're doing slightly different things at that time and that's it for questions, Chris, so you can definitely continue. Thanks for answering those. Cool, okay. So uh, because I believe in, in practical examples, so I'm gonna give you some examples of how I conduct my research before jumping into uh, emailing companies and trying to get, to get meetings. So a little bit of a level jump. So we are a sales training platform. We work with fast growing companies and uh, we help them onboard and train new sales reps faster and with greater consistency. <clears throat> So when I think about who my ideal buyer is and the companies who I want to reach out to first because they're the most likely to buy my software, I think about companies who have high headcount growth. So I look for companies who are hiring a lot of sales reps because my platform trains sales reps and the more sales reps to train, the more money we make. I look for companies who might have just raised a significant venture capital around. So typically this is series C or series D raises Usually with an injection of capital, companies go to grow their go-to-market teams, which means sales and customer success and marketing. I also look for companies who have a dedicated sales trainer or a dedicated sales enablement person because I need someone at the company to target and to sell to. I look for companies who are constantly launching new products. If I find a company and they seem to be launching a new product every three or four months, I know that they're constantly retraining their sales reps on these new products. So I'm gonna show you how I do some of that research. Uh, I'm gonna be looking at a company called Nucila. And fire off any questions here, because I know what I'm saying right now is a very specific example to my world that may not apply to a B2C model um, or similar models. So feel free to jump in. But when I target a company, first I go to their website. And uh, I look at the website, I check out the solutions they offer. I look at the company values. Uh, typically, I go look at uh, any press releases. So press releases are awesome for things like product launches or for venture capital funding. You know, I can see that this company landed a 50 million investment from the same investors at Spotify, so TCV. So you know, I look at this, 
I would um, read the article. I'd probably look for a couple quotes. I may look for other press releases around launching new products. So if I'm on their website, I see that you know this company has launched new solutions that they'll likely need to train their sales reps on. So to me, this is a compelling reason to reach out to this company because the sales trainer at this company is always training on new products. I may also go into LinkedIn and I can go and I can look at how fast companies are growing. So because I work with hyper growth venture back companies, I want to look at how fast specific departments are growing in the company. And on LinkedIn, you can get all this information. Um, so I can see that sales, the sales department is growing at 12% year over year here. I may also want to look at the company's job postings. So I can come in here, I can see who they're hiring for. I can look at the filters and I can see, okay, great. This company is hiring six salespeople. If they're hiring salespeople, it means they're training more. So these are all data points that I want to look for in order to understand whether or not this company fits my ideal buyer persona and is worth me investing the time in emailing and cold calling and trying to book meetings with. So eventually what you get is something that looks very similar to this. So we, real quick question, yep. um, I think that's super relevant before you continue is uh, how did you know to look at New Sela to begin with? Good question. Yeah, it's an excellent question. So um, you can run filters on, uh, on LinkedIn. So if I go into LinkedIn and I go into um, click, uh, what's the best way for me to do this? Do, 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 do. If anyone here has LinkedIn Navigator, I'm going to show you a bit of a tool right now. And then, you know, this is a paid tool. So I don't want to show a lot of tools that you, know, you won't be able to use, but I believe standard LinkedIn does this as well. So you'll be able to run reports based on headcount growth or based on, um, based on uh, company industry or based on geography. And this is how I put my lead list together. So I may look for um, companies who are in North America. So I put North America in here. I would go look for companies who are in sales tech, or sorry, in technology. So I put technology into here. I would go look for um, people who have sales trainer in their headlines. I would look for um, headcount by department. I would look for sectors that they sell into. I would use all these filters to put together a list. And what it would spit out is a list of companies who fit my ideal buyer persona. Uh, there's a couple other tools I'm going to touch on that will help show you this, but essentially you could use LinkedIn for this. You may want to look at like Inc's 50 or 500 fastest growing companies. You may want to find any blogs that have put the companies that you want to target into a category. Um, just try and figure out different ways that you can potentially create a list of companies to go after. Could be LinkedIn navigator, could be blog posts aggregating companies. Um, could be companies like Zoom Info that aggregate data. So I hope that's a good enough answer uh, that that kind of satisfies that. Um, Al, was there any follow up to that question? No, that was a good answer. I think your your buyer persona will often will often inform where you're going to be going to look for your customer. So if you can see Chris's ideal customer persona, high head count, raise venture capital, have a dedicated sales enablement or sales training role. So even as simple as something as putting into Google. Um, companies that have raised venture capital in the last X amount of months will probably yield him enough results to understand a few of his customers. Um, Chris is very, very adept at prospecting. So, uh, you know, he's got LinkedIn Navigator and he really thinks through his prospecting in quite a lot of detail, which is which is what you guys are seeing here. But it definitely can be um, a little bit more simple and you can kind of build on your processes as you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good answer. And there, there's a couple of tools that I'm going to show you in a second that will aggregate a lot of this research for us and it'll make your job a lot easier. But um, here's what we found looking at New Sela. So we found they raised a pretty big Series C from TCV partners in March. They've got a ton of job postings on LinkedIn. They've got about 120 sellers on the sales team. They launched some new products in January in 2020. And they've got a ton of people on sales training and enablement. So I want you to pay close attention to this slide because it's going to come back a couple times when we're crafting our messaging. Now, these are the tools that I mentioned that are going to help you aggregate your research. So Google Alerts is free and it's super simple to use. So Google Alerts is going to allow you to track any keyword mentions of anything on the internet. So I set up Google Alerts to track Venture Capital Series D. And then every morning I get a list of uh, articles or blogs where the keyword venture capital series D was mentioned. So I can start my day by prospecting into these companies that Google alerts have set up for me. You can set them up for any keywords that you think might relate to your products. 
Feedly does the exact same thing. Um, it's going to track mentions of certain keywords. Owler does the exact same thing as Google Alerts and Feedly. They're different UIs and they're different um, subscription models. I would recommend starting with Google Alerts. Set up keyword trackers for you think that for anything you think might relate to um, uncovering a need for your product or service, and then eventually look into LinkedIn or look, to, look into LinkedIn Sales Navigator because this is one of the best sales tools uh, out there. Cool. Okay, so. Um, We've gotten the research done, uh, so let's start to look at some actual email templates that we can use to send out messaging to our customers. So this isn't something I came up with. This is something I picked up from probably one of the best sales trainers in the world, this guy, John Barrows. And his theory on emailing is to use a why you, why you now model. So we're gonna fill in this template using the research we just learned, but it's a template like this that you can use to um, just really kick off your prospecting strategy. So uh, we got the recipient's name. I was researching your company on LinkedIn and notice reason number one. So plug in reason number one here. And I'm reaching out because I often hear how challenging it is for insert their role so it feels customized and personalized at venture back companies to, and then insert the challenge that you think your solution resolves for. And then the second paragraph, the, the, the body of this email should be your value proposition and how it relates to resolving that challenge that you outlined here. Then you've got a strong call to action. So if this is interesting, how's your cal calendar for next Friday, 2 p.m. for a 15 minute conversation? So let's see what that looks like with a couple of these points subbed in. Subject line is going to be something customized to them. So your recent Series C with TCV partners. If you're a recipient of this email, you are opening that email because that is a compelling subject line. This is not a mass email. This is clearly a salesperson who has done their research on you. Neil, I was researching New Zealand LinkedIn and I saw you just raised a big Series C round with TCV partners. Congrats on the growth opportunity. I am reaching out because. So this is that, um, that story Al told about um, saying the word because when you're butting in line with someone at a copier is gonna help you get better results. Use the word because. Because is a trigger word, word and it signifies in the recipient's brain to pay attention. So whether you're speaking or doing a presentation or you're writing emails, the word because is incredibly powerful. So this is where we sub in that challenge. So I understand it can be challenging for sales trainers at venture back companies to understand the best way to cut ramp time for new sales hires. Here's our compelling value proposition. So sales trainers at companies like XYZ use level jump to uncover onboarding metrics that help them get reps to quote up 50% faster. So whatever value prop you can sub in here that relates to the challenge you identified in that first paragraph is how you're gonna get um, emails that um, are, will resonate with a buyer. I'm gonna pause here. Does anyone have any questions about how we can use a simple template like this to sub in our value points that we got from our research to create a, a very simple email that is personalized, contextual, and that um, has a subject line that's gonna get you an open. Chris, can you, uh, so I was just actually typing an answer for you while you were trying there, but um, Chris, Chris J, um, is, can you just give a quick understanding of what Level Jump does? Definitely, yeah. So we're a sales training pl platform and we're built inside of Salesforce. So most venture-backed hyper-growth companies have dedicated sales trainers or sales coaches that will train all of their new hires on their product, on their skill set, on um, you know the sales process and all the tools the company uses. And we sell software to them so that they can use our software to better train all the new hires at the company. So Chris, just to add on to that, they, Chris was um, Chris's question was uh, wondering if you were offering sales training as a service that are now outsourced as opposed to doing it in house. Uh, Level Jump offers no professional services. They are a technology that allows you to um, essentially hyper accelerate your ability to train reps using your own data and your own Salesforce instance. Yeah. And I want to be clear that this is not like a hidden sales pitch in disguise. Uh, we only work with like companies that are thousand employees or, or higher. So definitely not uh, a sneaky sales pitcher. Yeah. And John Cruz is asking, what if your because was wrong, Chris? Is there an opportunity to rep, uh, represent a different one that might work better? Yeah. Exactly. So what we've got here is five research points. And because that initial point that I said, you know, it takes between eight to 12 touch points for a customer to respond, our initial because may be wrong. So then what we're going to do on the second email is we're going to talk about job postings or we're going to talk about how many sellers they have. And we're going to change that because. So we are going to change the challenge 
based on subbing in these posts. So essentially these are five different emails we got here, five different things we noticed about the company, five different becauses, five different value props or five different challenges. So what we're building is a cadence of five emails or five phone calls that we can use to um, make sure that one of these points hits home with them. Cause it could be that maybe this guy actually isn't going to be using their series C investment round to hire people. So this may not resonate with him, but if I hit him with the launching new products, maybe this is more relevant to his world. And on email four, he's going to respond to me. So we're building five different reasons we can reach out with five different challenges and five different value props. Mm -hmm. And, um, Chris, how do you personalize a message to a consumer? to buy my services for their parents? <laughs> okay, that's a very specific question. So how do I personalize a message to get consumers to buy a product for their parents? Yeah, yeah, so uh, it, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit tough. And I, I would actually just ask the question back, is this a consumer product or is it a B2B uh, product? Because I think those, those go back to I'm an inbound strategy versus an outbound strategy. What Chris is talking about here is is definitely going to be an outbound strategy where you're um, actively, it's a tech speaker for a consumer product. So um, Adriana, in this case, I would actually refer back to focusing on understanding your buyer, knowing where they are, and putting the advertisements and the messaging on the platforms where your buyers are, and essentially helping them understand why they have a problem that your product solves. So this technique that Chris is talking about, you're likely not gonna send direct personalized emails. You might be more inclined to do marketing email blasts that are focused on like discounts or a specific time of the year where your problem or your solution is gonna solve a bigger problem. Yeah, I, I agree with that. This model is probably not, doesn't lend itself well to individual B to C prospecting. But for any reason, if you did want to take that approach, like Alishan mentioned, understand your buyer persona and understand why or why not would these people buy the product for their parents. And then understand the reasons why they would buy it and then put those emails or put those reasons into an email. Chris, what is the next step if you don't hear back from a customer? Good question. Your next step is to send email number two and say, Hey, I noticed you have a ton of job postings for sales roles on LinkedIn. Typically companies hiring for a lot of sales roles struggle with X, Y, Z. So hit them with the second email. You may also want to pepper in phone calls in between these. So email one, then a phone call, email two, then a phone call, email three, then a LinkedIn message. So uh, we're only going to be talking about emails and phone calls today, but I will, I will touch on like how to run an effective cold call. But if you don't hear back, send a different email, with a, a different uh, subject line and a different value prop. The one thing I see reps doing all the time that is uh, a big mistake is referencing failed attempts. So if your email does not go, if your email goes unanswered, your second email should not be, hey, I emailed you and I noticed you didn't get back to me, but I wanted to talk to you about X, Y, Z. If they ignored you, move on. Do not address that they ignored you. Just hit them with that second email. Always provide value and never reference failed attempts. Mm -hmm. Chris, how did you decide to go after a series C or D, et cetera, company? Yeah, good question. So um, this is nothing that I really decided on my own. You know, Level Jump has been around for a couple of years and we've understood, you know, what the ideal buyer persona is based on like headcam growth or um, based on um, just data. So we look at historical data from like two or three years ago, which deals closed, which deals did not close. And for the ones that did close, what qualities do those deals that have closed possess? So if you're lucky enough to run a startup where you have customers and you've been selling actively, just look at the qualities that your customers possess and then go find lookalike companies. So that's what we did. We looked back at all the companies who bought Level Jump and we found that majority of them fell into a series C or a series D investment phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, you know, this is what we're talking about here in this presentation. Neither of these, um, neither of these, these things is mutually exclusive to one another. Uh, you know, Chris is talking about building a buyer journey and understanding who their buyers are so that they can actively make sure to solve a problem that they already know they have. Chris's emails and all the customers that he's working with are because he knows that they have a problem that once he makes them aware of that problem, he has the right solution for. So he's doing a really good job at that. Uh, Jason is asking what your open rate is, Chris, and if it's above 15%. And uh, what is a reasonable amount of time spent collecting data versus versus the open rate? Yeah, excellent question. So um, 
uh, to the second point first, um, the reasonable amount of time to spend uh, doing the research is about 15 minutes. So as I scroll through these tabs here, you know, once you get comfortable prospecting, you can probably find those five key points in about 15 minutes. Do not spend longer than 15 minutes on this because if after your first email, they get back to you and they say, hey, we just, we just launched a partnership with your biggest competitor. Sorry, we're on contract for three years and you've wasted an hour doing the research. Um, it's not a good use of your time. So max it out at 15 minutes. Um, for open rates, yeah, it depends on the campaign. Uh, some of my, my, my sequences or my, my email um, campaigns have an open rate of like 70 or 80%. Um, and that's simply because the subject line is personalized. So if you reference something very specific to them or to their business, your open rates will be much higher than 15%. That 15% is typically for mass email campaigns where there is no reference to you or anything specific about your business. Yeah, a lot of people get stuck in research loops because they're afraid to actually send a cold email or to pick up the phone and make a cold call, which is totally fair. Rejection sucks, guys. Uh, and, and we know that, Chris and I know that firsthand. We both used to knock on doors and big suits in the rain trying to sell photocopiers to businesses um, and that definitely hurts but um, you just got to do it you can get to a point of oversaturating your research and then ultimately you just got to admit hey it's time to it's time to go here um, Dior asks when you email again do you reply to your previous email Chris or do you send it as a brand new email yeah that's an excellent question I don't know the answer um, I've done both. So I use a tool called outreach.io and outreach helps me structure my sequences or my, my emails in a flow so that I don't forget to send them. Sometimes I set them up so that a reply to the email. So it has the re, uh, the re used to be like a trick sales reps used to use. So they would change their subject line to re and then they'd put the subject line. So it looks like there was a response from the customer. Um, that doesn't work as well anymore. So I actually don't know. Um, I don't know. There's no right or wrong answer. My advice would be to test both. Test both. What you don't want to do is have you know five emails where it's a re 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 and like you've got five unanswered emails. I'd recommend maybe not. Uh, you know, if two emails don't go responded to, I'd probably start a new thread so it doesn't look like you know if they see that they've ignored you, they'll probably continue to ignore you just based on trusting their gut instinct from two weeks ago when they first ignored you. So. I don't know, but I'd recommend if you're going to respond to, uh, if you're going to reply to your own emails, cap it at two or three. Guys, there's nothing more frustrating. I mean, uh, I'm the CRO of a company. I get cold emailed every single day. And being on both sides of the coin, I can tell you there is nothing more frustrating than um, someone trying to trick me into a conversation. Uh, it is sneaky. And even if there is a solution, there, there is, they have a solution that can absolutely help me nine times out of 10. I would even actually say 10 times out of 10, I am absolutely not speaking to them because it's sleazy, it's sneaky, and you know, if if there's an opportunity to chat, be authentic and be honest. I think a few people are agreeing here, but um, you know, none of this what we're teaching you or what we what we'll ever say is going to be uh, you know use tactics that are meant to trick people into responding to you. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, how, how often can we target the same person? If we email them, how long do we wait until the next email? That question's from Tally. Yeah, good question, Tally. Uh, again, no right answer, but research shows that every two to three days is the right, the right scheduling for a sequence. Now, it could be that day one is email number one. On day two, maybe you leave them a voicemail or you try to catch them on the phone. Then day four, you send the next email. And then maybe that afternoon you cold call them. Um, so there's no real answer, but for emails, I would wait between two to three days per email, but I would also pepper in phone calls in between those emails so that you're still top of mind with them. Guys, new data shows that it takes 18 direct contacts to book a uh, meeting with the right, right buyer in some industries. So you know if you don't hear back after two or three or four or five emails, don't give up. Um, Keep going. As long as you're adding value, don't don't worry that you're bothering somebody. You're only bothering somebody when you start to send emails like, "Hey, uh, are you under a rock?" or um, like things that are easily ignorable. But if you continue to add value, chances are that if it's something that's interesting, your buyer has gone and done their research themselves as well. Right? We talked about that educated buyer. Um, so, Chris, I'll I think you're good to continue now. Cool. Okay. Thanks. 
All right, so a couple of tools that you can use to send your email. So um, these are these are paid tools. Actually, Hunter is free, but uh, yes, we're in Sirius are paid. They have free trials, but I would recommend looking into these tools. So if you're gonna be doing a lot of email prospecting, uh, these tools will tell you when a customer has opened your email and how many times they've opened it. They also have templates. So if you continue to use a template kind of like uh, this one here, you can put the template into the uh, into directly into your Gmail or into uh, your inbox so that you're uh, creating these emails a lot faster, but most important is the open rate. So if Hunter or Yes or Sirius tells me when a customer has opened my email, typically that's a good time for me to call them because I know they're at their desktop or I know they're on their phone. Um, so I'd recommend looking into these tools to use templates and to track whether or not your emails are getting opened. It's also gonna give you a ton of data on what subject lines are actually getting your emails open so you can optimize, you can A-B test and do all those great things. All right, so that sums it up for emailing. So, like I said, these sorry, are sorry, Chris. one one thing. Um, uh, a couple of people have mentioned HubSpot. Yeah, it's a it's a good point, guys. HubSpot is not on here. This list is not exhaustive. These are tools that Chris and I have definitely used more than other tools. Sorry, HubSpot is is a good tool if you like the user interface. These tools are actually bolt-ons, so you know they fit on top of Gmail a little bit more smooth than HubSpot does. That tends to be a little bit more of a standalone. It's not that you can't use it. It's just uh, uh, it's just that these are the ones that we would probably recommend for general use across everybody because they bolt onto Outlook as well. Yeah, that's a good point. And I do love HubSpot, but the only time I've used the HubSpot inbox mail tooler is when we had a full HubSpot marketing automation solution. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not even sure. Can you? I guess maybe there is a free HubSpot that you can just bolt onto your Gmail. It's a great tool too, but yeah, like Al said, there's hundreds of these out there, so this is not an exhaustive list. It is, um, it's 7.30 right now. Um, Cleo, I don't know if you're uh, on the line right now. Do we typically do breaks? Um, you know, I think we could probably wrap this up in about 30, so maybe I'll leave it. To I wouldn't do a break then, I'd say just keep it pushing. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'm gonna move into cold calling. Um, Cold calling sucks. There's no two ways about it. Uh, getting hub, hung up on, um, having people be rude to you on the phone. Uh, it's super, uh, it's, it's almost humiliating sometimes, but cold calling is such an effective tool when done right. And it's such a, a horrible experience when done wrong. So what I'm gonna walk you through is just a very simple format you can apply to your cold calls so that you're not getting hung, hung up on and hopefully you're booking meetings. So here's just quickly what not to do on a cold call. And I see reps do this all the time. Do not waste time on pleasantries. When you're cold calling, and I recommend you do your cold calls, like block off an hour and hammer out cold calls all at once. But when you finally get someone on the line, don't waste time with, hey, how are you today? How was your weekend? How are you loving the weather out there? These are strangers, you know, get right to the point. Be respectful, but get to the point so that you're not wasting anybody's time. But when I say get to the point, I don't mean immediately jump into your value prop. Don't sit there and spill uh, you know, the five or six different reasons why they should use your service or why they should buy your product. Um, you literally have about 30, 35 seconds to um, capture interest, so don't spill your value prop immediately. This last point may seem kind of counterintuitive or um, just kind of wrong. So don't sell your product or your service on the cold call. The point of a cold call is not to sell your product. No one is buying any solution based on a, a, you know, a 35 second cold call. The point of a cold call is to sell time. You are selling the next meeting. So if you get someone on the phone on a, phone, on a cold call, all you're trying to do is to get them to commit to a 15 or a 30 minute conversation with you at a later date. So keep that in mind. You are not selling your products on cold calls. You are selling time. You are selling a meeting with you. So I'm gonna break down the anatomy of a cold call. And again, this is based on research, but it's, you know, it's different for every person. Make it your own, add your own flair. If none of this works for you, drop it and try something new. But this has worked for me. So a good cold call should be permission-based. So people always want to feel like they're in control. So when we open up our cold calls, we need, need to give them the opportunity to opt out. And usually that sounds a little bit like, hey, I know I'm catching you off guard here, but do you have 30 seconds for me to explain why I called? So give them an opt out. People don't like getting cold calls. And if you give them uh, the possibility to say no, if you give them the option, if you give them control, they're more likely to be receptive to your message. 
Good cold calls, just like our emails, are driven by research. So rather than getting a customer on the call and spilling our value prop, we want to ask them something compelling about their business that we uncovered through our research phase. We also want to incite some form of back and forth interaction. We don't want to sit there and have full on discovery and introductory calls with our customers on cold calls, but we want to, we want to have some sort of back and forth interaction and we can do that through an open ended question. And like I said, we are selling time. We are not selling products on our cold calls. Lastly, be respectful. Cold calls, like I said, they suck. They suck to get, they suck to, to do. Um, just be respectful of your buyers. And if they're rude to you, to say, hey, okay, sounds like my solution is not for you. Um, have a great day. Be respectful on your cold calls. So I'm gonna break down what this cold call structure might look like. And again, I'm gonna do this in the context of um, Level Jump um, in a second. So, you know, introduce yourself, its name, I'm calling from my company. Use your full name. And research shows that people who use their full name on cold calls are more successful. And that's simply because, you know, important people use their full names when they introduce themselves. Get permission. I know I'm catching off guard here, and this is a cold call. Do you have 30 seconds, 30 seconds for me to explain why I called? You know, you can make jokes out of this on that on the, the intro, be like, hey, you know, this is a cold call. Everyone hates getting them, but you know, do you have 30 seconds for me to uh, explain why I called? Explain the reason you called. The reason for my call is XYZ research. I just noticed you raised a round from TCV Ventures. Typically, I see companies who have raised rounds struggle with XYZ. So this is almost a very similar format to that email structure that I showed you earlier, except this is something we're verbalizing when we've gotten them live on the phone. And have a strong call to action. You know, if this is interesting, do you have 50 minutes next Friday for me to share how we've helped similar companies in your industry with this? So let's look back at this research. You know, remember these slides, that first point, Let's bake that into an actual, an actual structure here. So it's going to sound something like, "Hey Neil, it's Chris, Chris calling Chris, from." Real, real question: If somebody hangs up on you, do you uh, do you call them again, or is that person uh, removed from your list? How do you handle that? That's a, one that people get all the time. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, I used to have a sales manager who was all about hammering the phones. And he would always say, if you get hung up on, call them back and say, hey, we must have gotten disconnected there. Like, as if you're kind of, it's kind of a spiteful way of, of, of calling them again. But I recommend just drop it. If they don't want the cold call, they don't want the cold call. I would, I'd probably, I'd probably advocate email, maybe a LinkedIn message instead of a cold call. Because this is obviously someone who does not want cold calls. Al, what do you think of that? Do you, are you similar sentiment or different? Uh, I, it's a, it's a tough one because, you know, sometimes people cut you off and you call back and, um, it's a pleasant conversation, but sometimes you get, uh, an irritated person. Like I said, I, I think, um, it, it's a tough call. I think it could go either way based on mm -hmm. you as a person and your preference. The only thing I would say is if somebody hangs up on you and you decide to call them back, Definitely don't be rude. Try and cut that with a little humor. Um, you know, I used to be one of those guys that called people back and um, my line used to always be like, hey, I think, you know, I think I might've hung up on you by accident. Uh, and that's really funny to most people because obviously they know that they hung up on me. So I definitely got a few conversations from that, but sometimes, you know, it can backfire and the person says, no, I, I hung up on you and hung up again. And at that, and at that point, you yeah. kind of cut your losses. Yeah, one of my favorite sales trainers here in Toronto, David Premier, uh, always says, sell the way you want to buy. And I know that if I got a cold call from someone and I hung up on them, which I would never do, but if I did hang up on them, I probably wouldn't want them to call me back. So practice empathy, put yourself in the buyer's shoes and just do what you think, um, you know, sell the way you buy. And if you don't think that you would want to get cold called five times by the same person in a day, don't do that to other people. Yep. It's totally fair. Chris, uh, another question here. Um, so if you, you say, um, you, so you don't say at your convenience, but you give them a specific date in brackets, which might not be good for them. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I would never say at your convenience. So, um, I mean, it's, a, it's a, a lot of people do say things like that. I find that when you say things like, Hey, whenever's convenient for you, it changes the power keel. You know, the best sellers view themselves on the same power keel as the buyers and they view themselves as more consultants than salespeople's salespeople. And when we start to use this, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? This passive language, like, hey, I would love to jump on a call whenever it's convenient for you. I will accommodate my schedule to make sure that it works for you. We start to feel like a greasy salesperson, or we start to look, look like someone who feels their time is not as valuable as the buyer's is. But in reality, if your startup, the solution you're selling is valuable, they should be asking for your time because your time is incredibly valuable. Um, so I would never say something like, you know, whenever it's convenient for you, lead with, a, lead with a, a specific date and a time. And if that time doesn't work for them, but they want to take the meeting, they'll suggest a different time. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's it's super important to remember, guys, that you're not doing people, people aren't, do, you're, you're, people aren't doing you a favor by talking to you. It is a mutual relationship. It's not an alpha beta. It is a uh, mutually beneficial in that if somebody's bleeding and you have a Band-Aid, you're like, hey, I can sell you this Band-Aid and you can stop your bleeding. That works for both of you. But if you're like, hey, if it's convenient for you, you maybe want to talk to me about maybe letting me help you stop bleeding, that, that's, that's weird. So if you frame it in that way, um, and ultimately you shouldn't be talking to people that you can't actually help in some way. I mean, that that's not really why we're here uh, or th what selling is. If somebody has a TV already and you're selling them a TV and that's the same size and the same technology, um, you don't really, you can't really help them. However, if somebody lo is looking for one and, and you can help sell them one, again, there's a mutual benefit. So if you think about it that way, you'll also give yourself a lot more confidence in your ability to have those conversations back and forth with your with your prospects. Yeah, if you respect your time as much as you respect your buyer's time, the buyer will respect you more. Cool. Uh, any other questions there, Alejo? Nope, you can keep going, babe. All right, so uh, you might be asking, well, I don't have anyone's phone numbers, so where do I get their phone numbers from? Um, I recommend checking out Zoom Info, Lucia, or Lead IQ. So these are data aggregation tools, and I can go punch in someone's name into Zoom Info, and it's gonna spit out their contact info, so their phone number, maybe their mobile phone number, and likely their work email. So this makes prospecting so much faster because we don't have to go call into switchboards or call the office main line or hit the uh, you know, info at company.com. Um, so use services like this to find contact information. I believe uh, Lucia has a free component to it. I think Zoom Info does as well. Lead IQ I think is paid, but there's a lot of tools out there that will aggregate contact info so that you're not spending a ton of time calling wrong numbers or calling company switchboards. Cool, okay, so at this point, we've likely booked uh, a few meetings with our future customers our, or our informational interviews, but um, what do we say on these actual meetings uh, to make sure that we're getting the best use of our time and our customers' time? So because today is a super short day, we only have a, you know, an hour and a bit, uh, I'm only gonna focus on tips that are gonna relate to the first five, meet, five minutes of the meeting. So how you open a meeting is incredibly important because you know, people form first impressions within the first 30 seconds of a meeting and how you open the meeting is going to dictate the tone for the rest of the meeting and whether or not the customer is receptive to your messages. So um, a bit of this, um, a bit of the segment requires you guys to actually do some work. So uh, get ready because there's going to be an interactive component to this. So the first tip is plan your rapport. Um, so what is rapport? So rapport is essentially the small talk that we do with customers or with people we've gotten on the phone. It's the small talk before the business reason that we're both here. Um, now, rapport is the best way to build trust, build credibility, and to create a relationship with someone. Um, but it's also important because business should be fun. It should be human. We should be getting to know our potential customers as individuals and not just as the uh, companies that they work for. So I hear this old adage all the time that people buy from people they like, and it's very much true. And the best way to get someone to like you is to build rapport with them that is meaningful. So I'm not talking about getting on the phone and talking about the weekend or talking about the weather plans. Like these are, that's rapport that they can have with their barista at Starbucks in the morning. We wanna, comp we wanna create compelling and meaningful rapport with our buyers so that we enter into these business conversations. There's more trust, there's more credibility, and there's kind of like a little bit of a friendship that's starting to blossom here that turns these business relationships into, into more than that. So a couple quick tips. So what is good rapport? So good rapport is usually built within the first five minutes of the conversation. And there's a lot of data that supports that rapport should happen at the beginning of a conversation 
and at the end of the conversation. So let's leave the business conversation to the middle and let's have some fun at the beginning at the end of the meeting. Good rapport uses I language and not we language. So if you find that you're getting onto a call with a potential customer and you're using a lot of we language at the beginning, you're probably talking about your company instead of yourself. So we want rapport to be about you as an individual and about your potential buyer as an individual. And it's research driven. So um, the, the, the biggest challenge with rapport building is, is actually starting it. But we can use LinkedIn and we can use Twitter. We can use a lot of tools that will help us uncover compelling open-ended questions to ask our prospects about in order to build rapport. So LinkedIn, we can look at their career choices. We can ask them why they entered into a new industry. We can ask them why they took that in school. We can ask them about their interests or their volunteer experience if they've got that on LinkedIn. Um, we can look at their summary. A lot of people write really great summaries about them and their career journeys. And there's always, there's a lot of really good things we can pick apart in the summary section of someone's LinkedIn profile that's going to help us build meaningful rapport with them. Um, Twitter also is a really good source of, of rapport building um, information as well. The one piece of advice I'm going to leave you with um, on, on rapport building is, is start rapport with an open-ended question that is about them. People love talking about themselves and usually they're happy to do it and it's a great way to start a conversation. If you're gonna pull something off of Twitter or LinkedIn, the most important thing to remember is reference where you saw it. It's super creepy if you pull a tweet that they did a year ago and you just, you say, hey, you know, I, I noticed you like cats. Like, what's your favorite cat? Like, make sure you're like, hey, I saw on Twitter you posted a hilarious cat meme. Like, are you a big cat person? Do you have cats? Like, make sure you reference where you saw it or it can come across as a little bit weird. Cool. Any questions about how to build good rapport? You're good. Awesome. So we are going to jump into some live examples. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste this LinkedIn profile into the um, chat and then... Uh, I want you guys to actually go into this LinkedIn profile and tell me what you would use, how you would initiate rapport with this person. How do I copy this? Um, Al, what's the best way for me to get to the chat? I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Okay, so if everyone can look at the chat, holy crap, there's 75 messages. I would love for everyone to go to that person's LinkedIn profile and um, figure out how you would initiate rapport with this person. Chris, while we're doing that, just keeping an eye on time, we might want to just stick to one example. Sure. So I'm going to open this uh, profile here. For anyone who's not at their, their laptops or not uh, able to, to access LinkedIn, let's open up this guy's profile and tell me what you would use to talk to him about, to open the conversation. So his name's Kyle, he works at Drift. He's got a really strong about section here. So there's a ton we can pull from the about section. You can also look at his career history, whatever post he's made on LinkedIn. Is there something funny he's commented on? Is there something that he's published as a thought leader in the space that we can make a comment on? He's worked at a bunch of different tech companies. He has worked at um, what looks like maybe a not-for-profit. He's co-founder of a baby food company. He took, um, he's took. he got uh, an MBA in finance. So there's a lot we can work off of here. You know, I'd love to hear what people in the audience think they would have led with when building a rapport with Kyle. I'm mute for you, Chris. So Ed actually has a pretty good one, and so does Yassin. Both of them have, they both say that they would use a mutual connection to make an introduction. Interesting. So I like the mutual connections. It's a really good approach. But the challenge is with so many different, uh, with so many people that we add to LinkedIn whimsically, I don't even know half the people on my uh, on my LinkedIn list anymore. So you kind of run the risk of coming on and being like, hey, I noticed you know you know Bob from XYZ company. Like, how do you know him? And that person would be like, oh, I don't know. He, he randomly added me to LinkedIn one day. And then there's just silence. So you have nowhere to go from there. And then you're like, oh, well, cool. You want to talk business? So I like that approach. There's a lot of risk to it, though. Um 
Starter Pack says, I noticed on LinkedIn you started a baby company. Tell me how you got into that industry. And uh, Frida says she would ask about his founder experience. Okay, founder experience. Love that. Someone said the baby food company. Love that as well. Anything else? Uh, somebody's curious what sports management is. Just genuinely curious. Not, not overly relevant to this. Um, Oksana says he likes has kids, so I can ask why he founded that baby food company. Dior says, I noticed you went to school in San Francisco. What was your experience living there? Natasha says, I would talk about Joel Peterson. So a few different options there. Okay, cool. Yeah, these are all phenomenal rapport building techniques. Uh, let's see what I went with. So I've never done this. This is me on the live call with the customer and I had planned my rapport in advance. Uh, I've never kind of done this showing my voice to like 80 people. So, you know, be, be gentle. I think Alex, good to, good to finally connect to you here. Um, so I did a quick LinkedIn search on you before jumping on this call. Uh, and as a fellow ex-entrepreneur, can you tell me a little bit about Big Dip or Baby Food? Oh, we know oh sure. Now. Yeah. yeah, so my, my, uh, it was my wife's company. And she, uh, you know, have you heard of like cold pressed juices? Totally, yeah. Yeah, it's like Evolution Fresh. They have a Starbucks, all that kind of stuff. So it's uh, like what that is, just pasteurizing the juice. About using like the, the water pressure equivalent to like being in like the day. Cool. I'm not going to show the, the entire clip here, but the point is I went with the baby food company uh, example and we had uh, like a four or five minute dialogue about entrepreneurship, about, about why some businesses fail and some succeed. And I got to learn a little bit more about his family and his home life. So this creates a really strong, meaningful connection with a potential buyer. And I can guarantee Average sales reps are not having these types of conversations with someone like Kyle. Um, so this went a long way, helped build the relationship. Um, so congrats to whoever mentioned that baby food example, because that's what I went with as well. Uh, and it works super well. I got another, another example here. Uh, I don't know, Al, I think we're, we're, we're tight for time here. Yeah, I just want to leave enough time for discussion or questions. Um, All right, let's check along here. More, yeah. So my other tip for having compelling conversations with people you don't know is after you've built rapport, have an open-ended start to the meeting. And you know, so there's nothing more frustrating than jumping on a sales call with uh, someone you don't know and just not knowing how to transition into that business discussion. You know, the last thing you want to do is dance around who should be leading the conversation or kind of tiptoe around why you wanted to have this conversation with that person in the first place, whether this is a sales conversation or an information interview. So the, the real secret here is just tell them why you reached out and uh, ask an open-ended question. So kick it off by explaining why you reached out to them. Um, and that's using those four or five bullet points that you uncovered during your original research. And literally you can read them off and say, Hey, Kyle, I noticed X, Y, Z about your company. Was it one of these things that prompted you to take the time to talk to me? And that's the open ended question. Give them those reasons and ask them, was it any of this that made you want to take the time? So there must've been something about your email or about your cold call that incited enough interest in the recipient to spend half an hour with you. Like I said, time is the most valuable resource any of us have, and he would not have taken this meeting or she would not have taken this meeting if there wasn't something compelling about what you said to them in that email or that cold call. So it's important to find out what it was about your outreach that, that encouraged them to actually make the time. Cause that's going to tell you a lot about the challenges or the potential opportunities that you have with this business. So looking at this, Slide again, we've got these five points. You can literally rattle them off in a meeting to open the open the conversation. I'm gonna show you what that sounds like here. It's Neil, good, good to connect with you. The reason I had originally reached out, you know, we, uh, we work with fast growing series C, series D companies who are scaling and uh, onboarding and, and hiring people in, in cohorts. So what I'm seeing from you guys is, you know, just LinkedIn data. So you have about 50 open roles for sales on, on LinkedIn, so you're hiring fast. And I know you guys raised a pretty significant round last year from TCB. Um, that sounds like you had about a hundred sellers that you're supporting. And from what I can see on LinkedIn, that the enablement team seems uh, pretty strong. So you know, I'm curious if there's any of those things that the rapid growth and the accelerated headcount that uh, prompted you to respond to my email and, and spend the time. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it, absolutely. So, so we have we have um, hired like crazy, and. Um, you know, a, a big thing that our, our board, TCB specifically, are really interested in is like red product tip. So this is this is a this is a first interaction with someone who I don't know. And, and like I said, if we can tell them the reasons we reached out, show them all the research we did, and ask them what the reason they took the time is, 
in that open-ended question, uh, they start to spill uh, a lot of details about the companies, about the challenges they're going through, about their growth, or really whatever's relevant to your solution. So it's helping them start the conversation by just asking an open-ended question. That's it. Um, if there's any, if there's no questions about how to open the meeting, I'll do a quick recap here. Al, is there anything in the chat? There is not right now, sir. Cool. Okay. So as a quick recap, um, research is the foundation of any good outbound sales strategy. If we can do our research and uncover personalized reasons that we can put into an email, uh, we're much more likely to get high open rates and high response rates on our outbound prospecting, whether that's cold calling or cold emailing. Um, and ultimately just have fun and build trust with your buyers by building rapport at the beginning of a conversation. It can make every other aspect of a sales process much, much easier if that person trusts you and likes you. And lastly, open the meetings by telling them why you've reached out and ask why they took the time. It's the simplest way to start the business conversation. That's it for me. I'll kick it back to you to uh, talk about where to go from here. Awesome. Uh, so if, if you want to just click through to all, all the all the bullet points, um, I think there's a lot of overlapping stuff that Chris and I talk about, right? And I think what's really interesting here is that uh, so my company is a two million dollar company that we have that we have built up 100% from inbound, from focusing on understanding where our customers are, how they research. What do they care about? What are the journey possibilities for them through our application? And essentially, how do they want to interact with us to purchase? And on the flip side of that, you know, you saw what an outbound strategy looks like from Chris to really focus on reaching out to your customers and letting them know that there is a problem that you can help them solve. So kind of getting them into that funnel a little bit more proactively versus waiting for them to find you. Regardless of which approach you take or where you are in your business life cycle, there are some key takeaways that we really want you to focus on. The number one takeaway is understanding your customer. Who are they? Where are they? What do they care about? And I think that's a question that we can constantly be asking ourselves as our business develops. This is not just a startup mentality. All of the best companies in the world are always asking themselves, who are our customers? Where are our customers? What do they care about? I really personally admire Nike. So I, I know we've had some consumer-based questions here. And Nike is one of the companies that I constantly look at uh, as inspiration. Walt Disney Company, um, Pixar, those are companies paramount that I also look, look to for inspiration because they're always asking those questions. Who are our customers? For Nike, you know, if you look at Nike's branding through the year and how it's developed, just you just have to look as far as the models they use in their advertisements. They've gone from... Uh, you know, primarily white males. And now if you look at Nike's website, they use more unisex uh, individuals, people that can appeal to multiple demographics. You know, there's uh, very race fluid, very um, ethnicity. Their ethnicity is very fluid as well. And that's them trying to keep asking that question of themselves of who are our customers? Where are our customers? If you look at Nike again, you can see them. They've grown from uh, print to TV to the internet. Now they're all over Instagram. I'm sure you'll see them on TikTok, TikTok soon. Everybody's talking about the play inside campaign that Nike's running with their athletes. So they're constantly evolving the where are our customer strategy. And what do they care about? You know, you only have to look as, as far as Nike's quarantine marketing campaign, which is uh, play inside, play for everybody. You want to be an athlete. You want to, um, you want the world to take notice. Then what you should be doing is staying inside, playing inside for everybody. So obviously, what we're caring about right now is global health, making sure that we can all come out of this together, stay connected, and work for each other. And Nike's the the biggest example of a company that really, really continues to ask itself that question about its marketplace. And um, as startups, as companies that are growing, we can all benefit tremendously from constantly asking these questions. Uh, next, create your journey possibilities for your customers, right? So your, your customers don't only have to come in through your inbound channels. They don't only have to come in through your outbound channels. You can do a combination of both. You can do advertisements where your customers come in through Instagram and directly go through your sales team. You can have an e-commerce process for your customers. You can absolutely cold outreach to them. You could go to conferences. So think about all the ways that your customers can go through their journey in interacting with your organization, with your product, with your service. Not everybody buys the same way, so you should be understanding that you have to sell to every single person in the way that they want to buy if you want to be 
as successful as you're going to be. Experiment. You know, you, we're not geniuses. We can't say, hey, this is all the way people, all the ways that people are going to buy my product or service and interact with my company. And in knowing that, um, we can't have those silver bullet answers right out of the gate when we're starting. We have to go out and figure them out. The only way to figure them out is to experiment. Don't be afraid to fail. Try, fail, try again, fail, find something that works, and then keep doing that and keep trying new stuff and failing. You know, a lot of what Chris talked about has a lot of years of practice from him uh, perfecting it. I've seen Chris try hundreds, if not thousands, of variations of the different cold calling emails, of the different cadences, of different technologies. Um, and he's one person that's really mastered that. A lot of people look up to him in that in that way. These aren't tips that he just developed randomly or uh, through one time. He's failed a lot. Chris, no offense, uh, but but I think we both have, and that's it's really important to understand that experimenting and making sure that you're trying stuff is really key to, to driving your success. Don't be afraid to fail. And then finally, build your funnel. Uh, focus on all customers, whether they're at the bottom of the funnel closing deals with you or at the, they're at the top of the funnel just experimenting, trying to understand whether or not the problem you solve is something that's important to them. Uh, build that up. You need people at every single stage of that buyer journey in order to be healthy, in order to continue improving your business. So the slides are shared. There's a ton of really good takeaways we hope for you guys that you can action and some examples that you can use to inspire your own individual processes, especially from the techniques that, that Chris shared with you. Chris, would you add anything else there for uh, where to go from here? No, no, that's it. Um, just for anyone who's who's just getting their feet wet in sales, it can be extremely frustrating. Um, it, it's tough. And like Al said, experiment all the time. Uh, experiment with talk tracks, experiment with email formats, change your subject lines, always be changing something and optimizing. But the most important thing is tracking results. So pay attention to open rates, pay attention to your response rates, uh, pay attention to conversion rates on stages in your buying process. So always be using data to help drive your experiments. And, uh, you know, happy selling. I think that's about it. Any other slides? I don't think we have any more, right? This is Batman. Yeah. So um, there are a few questions, a few comments, and um, we can go into those, and I'll read them out. We can kind of uh, trade answering them, Chris. Um, so the first one is, uh, do, you ch oh, do you start with a cold email and then follow up with a cold call, or do you just choose one method to approach? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that for me? Do you start with a cold call? cold email and then a cold call, or do you just choose one method to approach? Yeah, good question. There's no right answer. Um, everyone tries something different. Uh, the one I personally advocate for sending an email first, so that way we've kind of warmed up the prospect. And if we've written a well-researched and a compelling email, hopefully they remember it so that when I phone them, they recognize my voice. And uh, if I need to, I can reference that email. But um, again, there's no right answer. But uh, I would try doing the email first and then doing a call the next day or that afternoon. Chris and I are different in that way. I, I absolutely am a call first person and then a, an email. So either way, it works. That's partly personality based. That question was from Natasha. Dior asks, do you think this process is applicable to businesses outside of North America? I'm wondering if there's a cultural consideration in sales. Oh, good question. Um, I'll take that know. one first if you want. Yeah. Um, yes, I think the easy answer is yes, you always have to be considerate of other people's cultures. Uh, one of the biggest things that I learned over my career is that not everybody communicates the same. Um, you know, for example, one of my biggest clients is Estee Lauder in Hong Kong. And in every email, they constantly are showing appreciation, gratitude, their language is very thankful. And that's not something that we see from customers, for example, in Israel, who are very direct and straight to the point in their communication style. Um, so I think that the process at its core definitely applies, but the language you use, the way you communicate with people, you absolutely have to be respectful of people's cultures and consider them as individuals and as people, like I said, um, you know, if you went over to your friend's house who was of a different culture, you would absolutely be considerate of their traditions and the way that they choose to live their lives. And it's, it's no different in sales for, for me, Chris. I don't know if you would agree. 
No, I, I would agree. I don't have a ton of experience selling uh, internationally. You know, I do a lot in the UK, but uh, that's pretty similar to here. So no, I think that was a good answer. Um, one thing to think about when we're talking about being respectful and uh, emp and showing empathy in our sales processes. Uh, with COVID, there's been a lot of changes in how my team prospects. Um, so I wouldn't recommend using that same uh, email style in the next like month or so when uh, when reaching out to people. I would probably try and be more empathetic and recognize that people might be in different situations. If you are jumping on a call with someone, your rapport is likely going to be around COVID and just making sure everyone is safe on their end. So just something to note when thinking about um, kind of different selling climates is, is COVID has kind of changed the way that my team approaches their go-to-market strategy. That's a good point. Uh, thanks for the nice comment. Oksana said she's really glad she chose this training uh over she had two topics to choose from and chris you personally learned and reinforced many of her points so thanks for that comment oksana thanks. Uh, ed says out of curiosity how many cold calls and cold emails do you send out on a daily basis with proper research per client before sending out at a 15 minute pace uh just curious for numbers chris yeah that's a that's a really good question so when i was at salesforce uh, our SDRs, their only job was to our SDRs and BDRs, and that's sales development rep and business development rep all they did was make cold calls and send cold emails. And I believe their activity targets were around 100 a day. So logging 100 emails or logging 100 calls or mixing those together. Um, I uh, I don't do a lot of outbound prospecting on my own anymore because I'm more selling to actual or selling to active customers. Um, but I would probably aim anywhere for between you know 50 to 100. But again, what you should be looking at is your conversion rate. So if you have been selling for three months, look back on your historical data and understand, you know, it takes me 50 activities to book one meeting. I have to book 10 meetings to get to one demo and I have to have 10 demos to get to one customer. So break down your conversion metrics and kind of work backwards from there to understand how many activities your SDRs, your BDRs or you should be doing every day in order to book enough meetings to get to enough demos to get to enough paid customers if you have like a demo phase in your sales cycle. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer, Chris. If a prospect agrees to an inf information interview, would you offer them a free trial of your product as a thank you or is this a no-no to minimize coming across to salesy? Good question. I, I personally, I think the way it's, it's, it depends on the way the, uh, the call goes. Um, so I've done that in the past and it's gone extremely well, but again, it's not from a, a standpoint of sales. It was, um, you know, I had a, a really great relationship and I asked the prospect to dig into the product a little bit for me just to, just to find out, uh, just to give me a little bit more feedback if they were open to it. So it wasn't necessarily as a thank you. It was as a continuation of the research if they were open to it. And it was very much a, uh, you know, if you don't mind kind of conversation, it's a, it's a delicate balance, Chris. Um, that's probably what I would say. I don't know if you would disagree with that, uh, Chris Gray. No, I, I agree. Um, and, and that's an approach I would advocate for all the time. In the early stages of your startup, get, get your product into the hands of, of many users as possible because your best feature enhancements, the iterations on your product, they're going to come from your customers. So you know, don't be afraid to give it out for free. But to, to, to Al's point, I actually, you know, it's a slippery slope. You know, I would use your own discretion and, and kind of feel out whether or not this is the right person to do a, a free trial. And maybe mm -hmm. I would call it a free trial, kind of like Ali Sean mentioned. It's like, could I get you into my product so I can get your perspective on how the product functions? And maybe that's a good way to phrase it. Yeah. I think, guys, like what, what, um, what those types of questions really highlight for us is that sales is not just a science and it's not just an art. A lot of what we talk about is the ability to kind of, um, formula like put a formula around sales or create a science from it so that it's a little bit more digestible at the end of the day you know there is that discretion aspect of you're a human talking to another human you're building a relationship you know you there is going to be um small things like do i trust this person do i like this person is this person attractive to me does their voice sound appealing to me all of those non-verbal cues verbal cues body language those all play into whether or not you're successful. You can do other things beyond this. If, if, if you folks are interested, um, there's a YouTube channel. It's called um, The Art of the Charm. And it talks a lot about why certain celebrities are so charming and lets you understand what are the small things that they do that create trust and actually make them likable. So that's a good kind of compliment 
to this kind of science-based approach to selling because ultimately, you know, if somebody likes you, they're far more likely to work with you, to want to continue to talk to you, to want to help you versus, you know, they really don't. Um, Ravi, all of the links to our slides are at the top of the chat. I know it's a long one, but uh, definitely Chris's slides are in there. Uh, Dior asks if there were, are any books you would recommend. Uh, Chris, I'll let you take that one first. Uh, you're the book guy, but um, my favorite uh, sales book is the Sales Acceleration. What is, uh, what's Mark Robert's book called? The Sales, Acceler Sales Acceleration Formula. So it's written by the ex-CRO of HubSpot. Yeah. And it is an entire playbook on how to grow a sales team. So it talks about hiring the right people. It talks about how to coach them, how to onboard and ramp them. It talks about inbound marketing, your strategy for getting warm leads. Um, my favorite book is The Sales Acceleration Formula by Mark Robert. Uh, or Getting to Yes is a good one. I also like how to win friends and influence people. But if you're going to pick one book, Mark Robert's The Sales Acceleration mm -hmm. Formula. Mm -hmm. I like to, uh, personally, I like to read um, biographies of people that I admire and look up to because I think that the story aspect gives me a ton of contextual information as to why they're why they're successful and there's often really 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 good practical examples of um, what they did and how it applies and, and you can make that relevant so um, Bob Iger the CEO of Disney his book just came out that was incredible uh, Ed Catmull his um, his his biography, which is called Creativity Inc. He's the president of Pixar. That's a good one. Um, Shoe Dog, Phil Knight. That's a really good one. Uh, you know, I think business books can be boring, but definitely relevant. So some of the ones that Chris mentioned as well, um, I I read and definitely recommend. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, Challenger Sale, Sandler Selling. But you know, I think. Choose books that you're going to be interested in, ultimately, because <laughs> those are the ones that you'll retain the most information from, we find. Yeah. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Going back to that book book comment there, um, I, I, I like sales books too, but I, I find that um, I, I kind of get, get bored really quickly. So go for audiobooks and go for sales podcasts. You know, audiobooks I can listen to at 2x speed. I, I love doing that while I'm walking down the street. Um, and there's some awesome sales podcasts out there. I would listen to uh, Sales Hacker would be my number one recommendation for you. Nice recommendation. Yeah, it's a good one. Oksana asks, are you going to be conducting more courses here? Um, if they invite us back, uh, we'll, we will definitely, we'll definitely come back. We always invite you guys back. Come on now. Yeah. Um, John asks in terms of sales activities, what would you say would be an appropriate split in time, say between CRM prospecting, emailing, cold calling, etc." Yeah, uh, good question. Again, no straight answer. Um, if you're just getting started with your business, I'd say dedicate 100% of your time to outbound prospecting. And once you get bogged down in actual customer meetings, maybe you scale back your prospecting. But um, I don't know. It depends on where you're at in your business. And if you're uh, if you're a, a small team and you, know, you get pulled into product discussions or marketing discussions, it's going to change. But uh, my recommendation is to just make the most out of your prospecting time. So dedicate specific blocks in your calendar for only outbound prospecting and then be true to your calendar. It's so easy to put these blocks in and just steamroll over them. But um, prospecting and filling the funnel is what's going to drive the growth of your business. And it's easy to skip, but if you don't do it, you're going to hit a growth slump. So um, I hope that's a good enough answer. John, one, one thing that I would add to that and it would be outside of the context of sales activity is that remember that in a day, you only have so much cognitive capacity to complete activities whether that's prospecting or being on phone calls with clients or being in meetings with colleagues or uh, you know, even things like spending time with your family members, kids, partners, et cetera. You only have so much cognitive capacity. So prioritize the things earliest in the day that are the most important that require the most mental effort. That way you can actually make sure that you focus your attention on those. So to be more specific with your answer, you know, maybe prospecting takes a lot of effort for you. So I would prospect first thing in the morning and I would schedule client calls later in the afternoon because those are relaxing. My clients are really great. Um, you know, they're, they're easy to talk to, but if I happen to have a challenging client call at 9am in the morning, that sucks up a lot of my mental effort. It's going to be really difficult for me to prospect later on in the day. Same thing with administrative activities. You know, they're typically, low mental effort, low mental energy. So scheduling those for the end of the day 
will really give you an opportunity to make sure that you're effectively completing all of your tasks. Mm -hmm. It's a little trick that uh, that you guys can use. Uh, Yasin Chris asks, do you leave voicemails? Yeah, good question. Um, I, I do. And uh, my advice on voicemails, and I got this tip from John Barrows, the trainer who I referenced a couple times, when you're leaving voicemails, leave your name at the very end of the voicemail. Because if you call and say, hey, it's Chris Gray calling from Level Jump, they are going to delete that. But if I call and I leave voicemail, say, hey, reason for my call is I noticed you raised the Series C investment round. Typically, I see Series C companies struggling with XYZ. They will listen to it. Do not start with your name. Leave your name at the end. Um, caveat is remember to leave your name at the end because I've left a lot of voicemails where I strategically did not say my name at the beginning and then I forgot to say it at the end and then they didn't call me back. So um, leave your name at the end so that it captures their interest and they listen the entire way through. Good point. Good point. Um, what tools do you recommend to track LinkedIn messaging and reach out campaigns? Um, LinkedIn messaging, I would just use LinkedIn for tracking that, that messaging. Uh, reach out campaigns, you can use whatever CRM tool you're using, HubSpot. Salesforce, Pipe Drive, uh, possibly Active Campaign. I mean, realistically, any tool that you're reaching out in, you should be able to track the campaign as long as you're using a campaign-based tool. Gmail, Outlook, those are not good tools to be to be tracking your campaigns because they don't archive them uh, relevant to the contact. So, lots of technologies. I would I would probably dig into researching that a little bit more based on uh, what your what your need is. And that was a question from Tally. Um, Ed asks, hold on, uh, do Ed, you Ed, one thing I want to oh, right. add, when you're thinking about tools for doing your outbound prospecting, I definitely advocate looking look at outreach.io, sales loft, and mixmax. Oh, yeah. Because those are incredible outbound sequencing tools that will structure everything I talked about today in one flow. So it could be day one email, day two phone call, day four email, day five LinkedIn touch. It will structure all those in a schedule and then it will remind you to do those tasks every single day so that you're not uh, mixing up who to email. They're expensive tools. If you've got the cash, buy them. Yep, that's a good point, Chris. Sorry, Outreach is a great tool. I, I really definitely agree with that. Um, more questions. Ed asks, do you use staff to do the research process to minimize or eliminate the 15 minute research time? Uh, we've used, uh, in the past I've used, uh, yeah, SDRs and, and interns, honestly, sales interns who just wanna understand a little bit about sales. So um, absolutely, you can get people, if you train them well enough and they understand the space well enough and they understand why people will buy your product, yeah, you could have people do the research for you. Um, you run the risk of jumping on that first call with them and then not being as well versed in their company as, as maybe you should be because someone else did the research. But um, yeah, hey, you're looking to save some time. I've, I've done it. Yeah, good point, Chris. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll comment on that one. Um, Dior says this is one of the best trainings she's ever attended. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Shelby says thank you. Oksana says thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you. Chris, any other YouTube channels or video recommendations that would be good for those who don't have time to read? I'll just start that by saying um, Cerebral Selling is one of my favorite YouTube channels and favorite LinkedIn channels. Uh, David Premier, Sell the Way You Buy, is really a consumer first salesperson um, and, and really, really takes the viewpoint of the, of, the, of the buyer. So if you have time to listen to his content, I would recommend it. Yeah, my one recommendation is gong.io. So gong is a sales tool that records every conversation you have with customers. And as a result of that, they have all these data and analytics on what keywords drive results on calls, when you should have rapport, when should you talk about pricing. So they put all this data behind sales conversations, they aggregate, they aggregate that data, and then they send out blogs and webinars and YouTube videos on how to effectively run your sales conversations for the best results. So if you're gonna look at one thing, gong.io is my favorite recommendation. Anything yeah. that they create content wise is gold. Yeah, it's steeped in data. I really love Gong as well. And I think they accomplish a couple of different things. David is very much a, um, you know, again, that actually highlights the presentation in a nutshell for us, Chris. David is very much a high level focused on people, um, understanding them to, to create sales. And Gong is very data oriented so that you can have a very logical and clear definition of, of what approach you're taking. So, both in combination, definitely very good practices. Uh, Jason asks, have you read Chris Voss's book using lines such as, have you given up on this project yet, or his work on the psychology of no? Um, yeah, Chris, I, I have read a little bit of that book. 
and uh, have you given up on this project yet? That is moving towards strip lining, um, which is a whole different conversation in my opinion. And it it's delicate. You have to use lines like that very, very carefully. People tend to overuse those. And this is a little bit of a sensitive one, but I like to think about that particular concept in terms of dating. So for example, you know, um, somebody blows you off over and over and over again, even though they're text messaging with you, and then you say, hey, it doesn't really sound like you're interested in hanging out. I'm, uh, I'm just gonna you know, stop messaging you. And um, that person might say, you know, yeah, it's not a really good time. Or they might say like, no, 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 no. Uh, I, I just been busy, let's hang out. In the first case, if they say, yeah, it's not a really good time, and then you say, okay, well, like, when would be a good time? You've kind of taken away your power of the, of the strip line and that power of no, because you've gone back and you've shown that you're not really willing to walk away. If you're gonna use lines like that, you really have to be willing to walk away for it to be effective, or you really lose all credibility of that person ever coming back to work with you in the future. Um, and that's super important. I see it being overused and uh, poorly executed on constantly by sales reps, and it's super frustrating. Yeah, I second that. You know, strip lining is, uh, it's very delicate. My advice on a strip line, if you're going to use a line like, hey, have you given up on this project? Um, I would make it a little bit softer, like, you know, hey, Customer, you know, we had a lot of really good interactions recently. Um, haven't heard back from you in a little while. Uh, I'm getting the impression that maybe this isn't top priority for you anymore. You know, I'm happy to pick this up in five months from now if now is not a good time for you. So just give them an out. Stri doing a strip line is just all about giving them an out. It doesn't have to be like, hey, I'm ready to walk away from this. You could just be like, hey, I'm happy to park this project and revisit in six months if that's a better use of your time. Mm -hmm. And that way they can just be like, yeah, you know what? I got too much on my plate right now. Let's touch base in mm -hmm. uh, you know six months. That's a good point, Chris. Um, I, I, I like. I'll just reiterate: be okay with walking away. If you are going to give that person a signal, you're going to walk away. Don't stick around. Be ready to actually leave that conversation um, based on what you've said to to hold on to your credibility. Uh, Natasha says thank you, thank you, Natasha. I appreciate that. Oksana, where do we sign up for notifications about your courses? We. Uh, don't have any courses per se. We build them as we go, as we get invited. So uh, no notifications, but um, I'm sure Cleo will let you know if we're, we're going to be back. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll throw our LinkedIn profiles into the into the deck somewhere. And like, feel free to reach out and add yeah. us on LinkedIn, and then you can keep in touch with us. And then anything we do in the future, um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep you posted. Yeah. Starter pack. How important is a personalized domain name when sending out emails as opposed to Gmail for your own business? I, I answered this a little bit earlier. I, I'm not sure if you saw this um, starter pack, but <laughs> it's super important to have a domain name if you're prospecting consumer to consumers. One, Gmails end up in spam. B, um, Gmails don't have any legitimacy associated with them. You know, um, it could be fake. People are less trusting of it. Um, there's no way for them to actually go and research you. Uh, so I would say it's extremely important. The first thing you need to do as a business is make sure that you can drive some legitimacy. People can research you. They can see that you're actually a real company. If they can't, um, there's no way you're getting a response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my advice, go on to Upwork.com, get a website created or make your own on like uh, Shopify or on, uh, I don't know, Squarespace or whatever. Buy the domain, 12 bucks a year, and then buy an email provider for like five bucks a month. So these are all like pretty low cost things that are going to completely change whether or not you get responses. I echo Al's sentiment on, on Gmails. Yeah. Um, Aida says, great lecture, thank you so much. Would you have any opinions on dropshipping model sales? Does it still work or is it oversaturated? I'll take that first, I have some thoughts. Yeah, I've never done a dropshipping business myself. I think they're super cool though. And I think uh, companies like Shopify and Volusion and WooCommerce and uh, Squarespace have made it really easy to create these businesses. So hey, I like them and there's a lot of tools to make it easier. So um, that's my two cents, but know that I I've never done a dropshipping business myself. Yeah, so dropshipping, I think any of those questions like the model, it's not that it's oversaturated because ultimately it's about the product that you are dropshipping. So I would more be asking yourself, am I, um, is the product that I'm that I'm drop shipping creative? And if you're talking more about drop shipping as a business, uh, you know you have to look at the competitive marketplace first. Look at companies like Shopify and look for your differentiator. What's going to make you different? What's going to make companies who sell products and use drop shipping as their method to get it into their consumers' hands? 
more likely or um, less likely to work with you. And if they have a company, why would they switch? So, uh, you know, no real specific thoughts, just, just overall more business focused comments. Uh, Ed asks, do you also add your clients to Facebook as well as LinkedIn? I normally like to add them um, when I've met them face to face at trade shows and events, but I was curious if you found success in this and are any concerns or points to consider when adding prospects to both platforms? I probably would not add prospects to Facebook. Um, I think it. I think it's Facebook is more about being personal. It's more about being social with your friends, your family. I find LinkedIn is the business app. Um, I uh, I'd probably advise not doing the Facebook thing, but hey, everyone's there. Uh, what do you think? I, I would agree unless you've built a, uh, like a connection with them that that goes beyond business. Um, you know, there's some sort of uh, personal relationship that you managed to create in a short period of time. That's that's probably where I would I would draw the line. I I definitely don't add my prospects to Facebook either. And some of my customers, you know, I've gone and visited them and had dinner in their houses, and I still feel a little bit awkward about Facebook. So um, that's up to you. I think that's that's a personal call. Yeah. It's a good uh, question. Yeah, John. Uh, John, thanks. Um, Chris J. Now that we have to communicate virtually, I'm considering Skype. But Microsoft 365 Business has Teams, SharePoint instead of Skype. Your thoughts and experience on using these tools for prospecting other resources tools you may recommend over these. Uh, John or Chris, sorry, Chris J. Um, myself, I've been a we've been a remote company goose chase for the last ten years. So we've been doing remote before all this has happened. And I can tell you that the tool itself needs to just function for your own use case. We use Zoom because we find that the interface is easier and more people have familiar, familiarity with the tool. It's very rare for us to find a client that uses Skype or, or business um, Office 365. The majority of customers that we work with are Google Docs and Zoom. So we mirror our customers' technology to make it easy for them to work with us. And I think that's a, a, a key consideration whenever we're evaluating technology for our business is do other customers adopt these technologies if they're facing our customers? Um, super clutch because then it makes it really easy to connect without a learning curve, without people having to download new technologies onto their computers, et cetera. So, you know, if your computers, if your customers use Skype um, and SharePoint, then you should be using Skype and SharePoint. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Chris. No, I think that was an excellent answer. My advice is is what you said, Zoom. You know, Zoom is free up for uh, up till forty five minutes. So just make sure your sales calls aren't, aren't longer than forty five minutes, <laughs> and you can yeah. use that for free. That's a good tool. That's a good tip. A uh, couple of Robbie says thank you. Um, Alexander says thank you. Thank you to both of you guys. Aida says thank you. Thank you as well. Uh, Yassine says thank you. Frida asks when to send a LinkedIn connection to prospective clients after the initial cold call and um, email. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and again, no right answer, but I would say if you've had one meaningful conversation with them, add them to LinkedIn. Grow your network. Um, it's uh, it's it's it, it helps from a marketing perspective too. So maybe you have a, a discovery conversation or a first meeting with them, and they don't convert to a customer, they don't advance to the next step in your sales process. If you have them on LinkedIn, every time you share a piece of content, every time your company announces something, they'll see that, and eventually, if it resonates, they'll reach back out. So I would say the earlier the better. And like, what is the harm in adding them if and they don't add you back? Like, you know, no big deal. I would take the shot. I uh, I would agree. LinkedIn is a, is a bit of a crapshoot, you know, again, like the key is, are you providing value um, with, with your ad? Um, I have a lot of people that reach out to me on LinkedIn that have no idea, I have no idea who they am or who they are, I've never met them, and there's no note. Um, it's a little weird, I mean, but on the flip side, when people are like, hey, the reason I'm adding you is because X, Y, and Z, uh, it definitely gives me way, way more incentive to, to add them, that's, that's the truth. Um, so up to you, but add value. Just you know, wherever you go, whatever you do, make sure you're adding value. And I think that's a general good lesson to live by as human beings. Uh, try to add value in other people's lives. Cool. So uh, a couple more thank yous from Ed and Chris. Uh, we really appreciate everybody, everybody, get, every one of you, and everybody 
coming to our presentation and sticking around all the way till 820 on um, this just another day in quarantine. I'm sure you guys have lots to do, lots of work. Uh, we really appreciate it. End of the month. Um, please feel free to add us to LinkedIn. A few of you guys have already found us and um, we'll be happy to respond, answer questions as necessary. But we feel appreciative and grateful for the opportunity. So thank you to, to, to Startup School as well for inviting us back. Uh, Chris, anything to add? No, no, this has been a real pleasure. There's been some incredible questions. This is a really, really smart group. So it sounds like you guys have been trained super well in the last startup sessions. Um, and I appreciate all, uh, all the thank yous and all the really nice comments. Um, this has been a, an awesome experience for both of us. So thanks, everyone. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, guys. Have a good night, everybody. And fill out your surveys. Fill out your surveys. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye.